company. A lot of these folks normally have no way of getting access to credit, not because they wouldn't be credit worthy, but because the structures that exist do not support access to credit for people like this because there is no data by which you can score them, by which you can decide who gets credit or not, right? But by giving them a platform like this that allows them to build transaction histories, we now have a basis to do the scoring, right? And so based on this scoring, we can identify that actually this person qualifies for credit and then we extend credit to them. Interestingly, we find that over 80% of the people that we give credit, this is the first time in their lives they are getting credit from any source. Right, so over 80% of our credit recipients are first-time borrowers of any sort. We, we think that is um, quite critical. The way the microcredit works is that we look at what you buy and we're like, you know what, we can give you an additional 100,000 naira if, if in Nigeria for you to, to buy, right? Because we kind of know that you're going to sell off this product. So we give you this at very attractive um, rates. Um, but you, you, you pay us back after you sold or as you sell off the product, right? So within two weeks or four weeks, you know, you pay us back. Right? And usually that's all the, the retailer is looking for. So imagine you have a store and you want, to, you want to be a retailer. The thing you need is you need cash to buy product so you can sell it. And now you have this proposition in which someone is actually giving you that money and then helping you get the product and then you sell it, make money and then you're able to pay back. Right? And then you can do this on a repeated basis and suddenly you're growing simply because you have um, access to finance. While many startups have been pushed out of business due to the harsh effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, this logistics company found a way to beat the virus. Again, taking advantage of technology, Trade Depot launched a digital-led distribution during the nationwide lockdown. So instead of losses, the company remained on the gaining side. Distribution requires movement and we had the restriction of movement. But um, the, the net effect on our business was positive, right? Because you know our business is all about promoting a way of distribution that is digitally led. And so when the lockdown resulted in the traditional distribution channels not being available or being very limited, it it significantly increased the urgency for everyone, both the retailers and the manufacturers, to adopt more digital channels, right? So the net effect we saw was a, a growth in our business, but more importantly, we saw an increased urgency for adoption, both by the retailers and the manufacturers. Aside Nigeria, Trade Depot has a strong presence in other countries. The company is however looking to expand into many other African states to become the leading distribution channel for companies on the continent. We think there is an interesting opportunity here to grow to be a leading uh, distribution channel for FMCG, for consumer goods generally across the continent. right? Uh, and we see the way the market is evolving, we see a few efforts on, to do this uh, uh, you know, across the place. But we certainly think that we're in a good place to grow to be that party that you know, uh, most consumer goods manufacturers depend on to help them drive their route to market. Conversely, we think as well that we're well positioned to be the ideal supply partner for, for retail. And, and we're, really very aggressive about our ambitions to, to, to look to be that leading party on the continent. isn't it? Well, you must be quite familiar with the phrase, catching them young, right? And next up is a very perfect example. Over the years, we've sort of created a notion that certain jobs are only to be undertaken by men, with the ones perceived to be less tasking, pushed to females. But interestingly, these barriers are fast being surmounted.
my goals for this shoemaking, this thing, is for me to be worldwide. Like, they should know me everywhere in all the old countries. Like, this lady, uh, this is my tender age, oh. I want to be very, very popular. Like, so people to know me um, about this shoemaking. I want to have. A very big store, a very a big showroom. Go for a wrong way to showcase my design and also for an exhibition also. My name is Karen Fetia. I am 16 years old. Fatia Karim defies two barriers. One is that there are no age limits to becoming an entrepreneur and the other is that no business is gender specific. She's typically living the best of both worlds. Shoemaking is what this 16 year old has grown to love. What could have been an idle period for many of her contemporaries turned out to be one of the most rewarding moments of her life. I started when I was 14. That was 2018. It was when we were on holiday, so my auntie, she introduced me to the job, so she asked me to just come and learn. When I started, I was not really interested. The work was not really easy. It was stressful going to the market, coming back, filing. When I started, my hand self was spending me. I was so tired carrying all those heavy material because I was not used to it, all those material. That was important to me that ah, all these materials that, that are mainly for boys and men, not for ladies. So you just started. They just telling me that I will get used to it. When and I got to understand more about the job, I found so, so many interests in it. Rather than letting other people discourage her, she focused on her entrepreneurial venture and gradually things got better. This resilience, she says, was easy thanks to her mother's support. I was a little bit discouraged by some other people. Uh -uh. There are so many other trades for you to learn. Like, why are you learning these so many things? But I stood to my words. When I started, if I show someone, I say, this one is not neat. It's so distinct. It's so distinct. They do complain. But we all what they do say. I was never defeated, so I stood to my word because when you have something, when you are determined for something, I want to achieve something. But I face so, so many challenges in this work. I feel so happy about it because a lot of people are, a lot of people are outside. I don't have any hand work because I feel so opportune. I'm so unique by this work I'm doing. Because most people, they'll be like, ah, a girl, a little girl like this. My dad, when I was about to start, he asked me not to go. That why will I go and learn that I should go for another, um, another option. But I told him that that was what I wanted to learn. He did not allow me. My mommy really stood beside me. She supported me, bought a filing machine for me, bought some materials for me. Gave me money to get them myself. Gave me money to get them myself to start practicing to be perfect. When I told her dad, he said no. I said, your daddy said you should not do it. I wouldn't tell her dad until she made a slip pass for me and I showed her dad and see what Peter did. He now said, Peter did, I showed him another one, I showed him another one, he said, ah, so now said that, can she make uh, a slip pass for one of my friends, a lady, she said, what's her size? She said, this is her size. And I'll show her dad his uh, machine, filing machine. He now said, ah, I want to tell you any, I said, yes, so when she did, my dad said I should not do it before, I said, no problem. Besides chalking in profit from a shoemaking business, the skill is also helping Karim cut some of her personal expenses. Making things for yourself will be so easy. Like, I don't make bags, shoes, like, I don't need anything. Like, I don't need anything 
from someone like borrowing something or asking someone for something, something I need, especially footwear. Like I do make slippers for myself, shoes, sandals. The process of shoe making is very, very easy. Firstly, you need to get your pattern. The pattern, the size pattern, then you trace it on either your rubber. If you are doing a Marco Nora, this thing, what I did today was foreign sole. So you build the insole in it. The uh, Marco, you trace the pattern on the Marco. Then after you cut it, then when you cut it, you also trace it on the carry board. Mm -hmm. Then you apply gum on it, you let the gum dry. Mm -hmm. Then you glue it together. Mm -hmm. Then you file it to smoothen the edges. Then after filing, you also place it on your lining. After placing it on your lining, you trace it. After tracing it, then you apply gum on it. Then you fold the edges, the insole. That the insole have been built. Then you file the sole. After filing the sole, the pattern for the upper, you cut it. You, have, you also apply gum, the same procedure. Then you use your last. You use it to last the insole with the upper. Then after lasting, then you file. Then after filing, you apply gum and glue it together. Then you armor. That's all. We have shoes, we have sandal, we have baking stalls, we have foreign sole, we have eel, we have wedge, so many design and we have so many design or so many patterns of design in shoemaking. Balancing school and work for the young girl isn't so difficult as she uses her holiday period only to learn more about her craft. I don't go to work when it's time for school. I don't go to school. Then when I'm back I don't go anywhere. Only when we are on vacation on holiday that's when I do go there for like two months or three months. Then I'll be when we resume, I'm going to continue schooling. Then if you have another holiday, I'm also going to go. I also work when I come out for school. If I have any work to do at home, I do work on weekend, not during school hours. So I work weekend, Saturday, Sunday. Like if I have any other work, like if someone asks me or want to patronize me to do anything during school hour, I'll collect it, then I'll find a way to do it. And I'll give it to the person during school hour, after school. But I don't go to work during school hours. Yeah, my school and my shoemaking is not affecting me. Electricity is one of the major resources she relies on to give finishing touches to her shoes. Unfortunately, she does not yet have the capacity to provide an alternative source of power for herself and relying on electricity distribution companies can be such a long wait which is bad for her and the business. Most of the time, I won't be able to work for like a week or months because there's no light. When our lights spoil, I have to wait for Nepal to bring the lights. And I don't have gen that I do carry it, so light is number one. And materials also, because when I go to the market now, it might not be the same price I bought it last week. I'm going to see the same material the same week. Young Fatia intends to grow a business to a valuable fashion brand that can compete with other brands at international exhibitions. My goal for this shoemaking, this thing, is for me to be worldwide. Like, they should know me everywhere in all the old countries. Like, this lady, at this my tender age, oh, I want to be very, very popular. Like, so people to know me um, about this shoemaking. I want to have a very big store, a, very, a big showroom, go for a long way to showcase my design and also for an exhibition also. My advice to younger people like me outside there that they should not be discouraged about anything they want to, anything that they determine to do, they should not be discouraged and also they should also work hard because working hard is also the key. They should work hard, never give up, not to give up, and not to relent also on anything they want to do. Entrepreneurs are indeed national assets. Their innovations may improve our standard of living and in addition to creating wealth from their ventures, they also contribute to reducing the rate of unemployment in our society. 
that's all we have for you on this episode of Startup. Until I come your way next time, I am Abisola Adebayo. Opinions are free, facts are sacred, the truth is universal. How in practical terms can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the families are for it. On DG360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion facts and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians are saying in this uh, part of the world. A new Nigeria is possible, a future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for any governor to look for grant for ranching. DG360, dissecting the issues. Well, many thanks for staying with us on the newsroom. I am Fola Shade Ogurinde. The presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, has filed his petition challenging the victory of Bola Tinubu as Nigeria's presidential elect in the 25 February election. Obi will came third in the election, filed his petition at the presidential election petition court in Abuja at about midnight on Tuesday. In his petition, Obi prayed a court to counsel the 25 February presidential election and order a fresh poll. On Tuesday, being the 21st day after the declaration of the results of the election on the 1st of March, is the last day he and any other aggrieved candidates and political parties had to file their petition in court. President-elect Bola Tinubu has urged new governors, elects and lawmakers elects to embrace their opponents and supporters to achieve a united Nigeria while congratulating the winners of Saturday's governorship and state houses of assembly elections Tinubu said it was important for the winners and losers to initiate the process of healing. According to the former Lagos State Governor, the election is pivotal to the growth and sustainers of democracy and democratic governors at the state levels. The publisher of Desert Herald, Tuko Mamu, has been arraigned on a 10-count charge bordering on alleged terrorism financing. Mamo was arraigned on Tuesday by the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation before a federal high court in Abuja. The accused, however, pleaded not guilty to all the counts and denied having allegiance to the terrorists. Mamo is alleged to have received $120,000 as ransom payment on behalf of the Boko Haram terrorist group. The monies were said to have been received from families of hostages kidnapped during the Abuja Kaduna train attack. 
Vaccine maker Moderna Incorporated expects to price its COVID-19 vaccine at around $130 per dose in the U.S. going forward in a bid to ramp up its vaccine manufacturing itself. According to the company's president, Stephen Hodge, in an interview on Monday, the move comes as purchases move to the private sector from the government. Hodge said the company had more than paid back federal support by selling a similar number of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines to the government as Pfizer for around $3 billion. The Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has raised interest rate to 18%. The CBN governor, Godin Emir Fili, disclosed this at the end of a two-day MPC meeting in Abuja. Emir Fili explained that the rise in interest rates is to rein in inflationary pressure, which is currently at 21.9% as of February 2023. Israeli settler movement celebrated on Tuesday after Parliament annulled part of a law banning them from residing in areas of the occupied West Bank the then Israeli government evacuated in 2005. The parliamentary vote notably paves the way for Israeli authorities to formally allow settlers to return to Homesh, the only one of the four sites whose residents were forcibly removed before their homes were demolished. In sports, Roy Hodgson has been reappointed as Crystal Palace manager until the end of the season. Hodgson, aged 75, returns to managing his boyhood club for his second stint after Palace sacked Patrick Vieira last week following a run of 12 games without victory. Hodgson, who was in charge of Selhurst Park between 2017 and 2021, takes over with Palace line 12th in the Premier League, three points above the relegation zone after a 12-match winless run. And that's it from the newsroom. Many thanks for watching. I am Fola Shadi Ogurinde. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the 2023. Governorship and state houses of assembly elections holding across 28 states of the 36 states of the Fe and 36 states actually of the federation i am dj badimasi now eight other states including anambra bielsa edo ekiti imo kogi oshun anundo all have off-season governorship elections due to of course litigations and court judgments now while 20 out of the 28 states uh, in today's elections are controlled by the ruling apc the Opposition People's Democratic Party, that's the main Opposition People's Democratic Party now, controls eight. So, let's quickly take a look now at states controlled by the political parties 
according to the six geopolitical zones of the country and see uh, how it might likely play out there. Now, in the southwest, you have um, six states in the south. Is it six? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six states in the southwest of the country, but not all the states are holding governorship elections today. So there's no governorship election taking place in Oshun State. There's none taking place in uh, Ekiti State. And there's none taking place in Ondo State. So in three out of the six southwest states... It's been 42 years now since St. Ambrose's Catholic Secondary School was established by the Catholic Church before it was taken over by the government. Several students have passed through the four walls of the school, just as several administrative staff have come and gone. But the one thing that has remained largely unchanged is the infrastructure and teaching facilities in the school. Year by year, things got worse. Classroom buildings began giving way. The classrooms themselves became inconducive for both teaching and learning. Things were literally in an abject state. We have been managing teaching even when the rain is falling, the rain will be falling inside the classroom. We cannot abandon teaching. As long as we, we mass students together when there is no uh, conducive classroom. During the time, I know of the past principal, Mr. Ogumbadejo Fola. So when he came to the school, he discovered that things will not be going on like this. So many classrooms are leaking, some roofs are even off, some buildings are collapsed. The parents are not able to do anything concerning anything, so we'll be folding and then every year, the removing, the removing, the removing have been taking away a lot of money. So he now decided to go spiritual by calling upon God. So every Thursday of every month, we used to gather together, spending 30 minutes, calling upon God. So we look for the name of some old student. We got the name from uh, uh, one of the old students called KK. We wrote their name on the pieces of paper. During the prayer time, we raised the name of God to compare them to God. Either by divine intervention or mere coincidence, something happened. One of the old students of the school decided to pay a visit. Multiple award-winning journalists, Deji Bademosi, graduated from the school 26 years ago as the senior prefect of the 1994 set. I went there to do a story on the dilapidated state of the school. And um, there's a project we're actually doing, uh, a project that I'm actually doing, 
known as Track Nigeria, being supported by um, the MacArthur Foundation. So uh, the, the whole idea for me initially was to go there and um, highlight the dilapidated state of the school so that I could call the attention of the government to uh, the situation there and uh, to see if the government could at least come in there to help address the infrastructural problem there. But you know, when I got there, and because that's the school I actually attended myself, I, I was touched. And um, you know, I, I just felt rather than just tell the story and wait for the government to do something, that at least I could do something to, to help. I was really touched and I, I decided, well, that at least we could do some renovation. So the whole idea was, okay, go there, renovate, and um, that was how it started. An engineer was contracted to commence work on the site, but little did they know that the structure required more than the planned renovation due to the severity of the damage. When I got there, all the foundation was already above the ground level, meaning that you can even be seeing the, the foundation footing already outside exposed, which anything can happen, the building can collapse at any time. After opening the the space for the column and the second day you know the building is weak already even with the exposure of the foundation i said so one side of the classroom gave way immediately the only thing we could do to salvage the situation was to pull down the entire building and uh, you know, build a new one. And for me, that was something really huge. It was um, not something that I had actually planned for, uh, considering the, the, the cost implication. So I summoned courage and I said, you know what, okay, you guys go ahead, pull the building down, we'll put up a new building. It was a tough decision, but certainly worth it. The reconstruction officially kicked off in August 2019 under the direct supervision of one of the alumni of the school. We left here like 26 years ago. And there was no any kind of a maintenance since we left. So I supervised the building right from the scratch to where it is today, all to the glory of God. As the new building started to take shape, it was hard to ignore the remaining dilapidated blocks of classrooms and abandon them to decay. As one building was getting completed, uh, I looked at the situation again and I felt, well, we can do another one. So I said, you know what, I, I looked at my post and I said, well, maybe I could just try the second one. And then the second one came down, the, second, the old building now came down and we started work on the second one. And then the third one as well, you know, one of the old students there came to me and said, look, supposing I support, provide blocks for the foundation, you know, and then, you know, build it up to Linton level, would, would you be able would you mind to just take it over from there? And I was like, okay, let's see how it goes. Because I, I knew it was going to cost a lot of money, but, um, you know, that was how the third building started. Then there was no plan to have a toilet. The school had no toilet. But then I felt, look, it wouldn't be nice at all to have these new buildings. You have the students there and then they have no place to go ease themselves and they, they have to make use of the bush. Again, I summoned courage and I, 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 I said, okay, you know what, let's 
put um, put up a toilet facility there, and um, that was how the toilet facility came up. So right there now we have ten toilets. I then thought, if you have a toilet, how then do you get water to service the toilet? And the school has no borehole. The school has a well, a well that dries up during the dry season. And then, again, not planned for initially. Remember, I started by saying we wanted to do just one building. Not planned for. So I said, okay, let's get the borehole. After the borehole, then came the landscaping and flooring of the school. As the school continued to get a facelift, it was almost unbelievable for staff and students who watched their wish become a reality. It's a thing of joy to me. But on a daily basis, when I come to school, I have to look down and see the buildings, which is not common, it's one in town. I was made to know that there is no school that is having this type of building. No school. You see the restroom, you see the classroom, you see the offices, you see the type of furniture there. It is second to none, I must confess, and I'm very happy. In fact, about five teachers called me, sir. How can I get my transfer to your school? And we start everything together. You understand? The foundation, the building, the roofing, the plastering, the painting, and everything. I was there with them, being one of the host students. By the time our students see what is going on in the school, they were all happy. You understand? By the time we want to do little, little works there, I have to call them. This is your class. You are going to use this class. So what can you people do for us? And they were happy in helping us. Packing sand, gravel, you know, all these things, little, little things that they can do, that they can do with joy. You know, they were, they were, in fact, they were happy doing it for us, being their school. And I believe by the time we are going for a new section now, we are going to have more students. I felt so proud that at least I could contribute in my own little way to this present development. This is project is single-handedly done by one person, a God-sent person, who is not a politician, he doesn't get free money from anywhere. He works hard to get his money. And he's not investing for any profit. Like I asked Deji. Because we said, bro, what are you even doing this for? He said, Maurice, I'm doing it for God and for humanity's sake. That look, I don't need all these students for anything in my life. I don't need them to survive. I don't need them to get to any position. But someday, my children might need them. It's a very good thing. It's really done well. I feel so proud to be part of 94 set. I feel so proud to be a friend to Deji Bademosi for all what he's done. And I feel so proud to be part of this project. The school, which was once looked down on, has now become a point of reference and top choice for people in the community. People passing on the road, they were actually branching to see that could a better structure be on this school with what they have been seeing. So look at the design. Look at the, the space that we, we managed to get what we have and a, a very special classroom corridor with a, a staircase that can easy the uh, going and coming of the students. So is a new, is in fact, the facility that is there make it more, more, far, far better. The only thing that makes me happy is that these students will now learn in a good environment. And this will also enhance their quick grasp of what, whatever has been taught in school. 
makes them relax. You are safe. They feel safe now. I think the last time we went there, we saw the building. I couldn't imagine how they could understand what the teacher is saying. But one, you're not sitting well. You're either standing and you're receiving your lecture, or you're sitting with somebody. But with what we have on ground, I think the student will be happy to learn well in that good environment. Many young young ones now. They are planning to come to St. Ambrose. Before you see some parents when they are passing by, ah, they used to say, "Oh, mommy, the Lord is with you." That's what they, they used to say it in our language. Oh, mommy, the Lord is with you. We used to call you Betikon. I myself then I cannot say this is my school, but now I can boast. This is the school I'm, I pass out from. So I'm very, very happy and I'm using this medium to thank the departments for what they have done for our school. He rebuilt our school and God will rebuild his life. With the junior classes also referred to as downhill now wearing a new look, the school authority, in addition to their great show of appreciation, are appealing for the extension of this gesture to the senior secondary classes of the school as well. Permit me to ask like, like an Ufilifar twist. If this structure could continue to the senior section, it would be very good. Not as somebody living in a modern building, coming to a leaking classroom, a classroom where there's no fan, a classroom where there's no in fact, dusty, stinking, rotting shears, the shockboard is even not good. It will not be so good. Permit me to tell you that we don't have laboratories in this school. Every classroom in this school is leaking. It's leaking. It's Dusty, smelling, I'm sorry I'm using these words, but if you care to look at them, you will not like them. So, such, such, I mean, so will it be for a student that is graduating from junior section to senior section? It will be demoralizing. For the man who has single-handedly done all of these, his primary goal is to pass a strong message across to the government, old students, and the general public. My hope and intention is that when the government or the governor, if, if the governor comes to commission this, that when he comes, he would at least see what you know, an old student has done. And then that could serve as some kind of motivation uh, for the government now to do something. And not, not just for the government now to do something, but also important for other old students to take a cue. I mean, those who have, um, well, been blessed to at least take it. And what I tell people is, you really, I'm, I'm not a rich person, I'm not rich. It, it cost me so much. And, um, but you, you really don't have to be rich to do certain things. So as an old student, even if it's just a block or two, you're able to contribute, that would go a long way. And also very important is, is that, um, you know, people have always said, uh, journalists always take, they don't give. And this is to disprove that. That journalists do not, we don't just report situations. So sometimes, uh, you know, journalism could make you do some very unexpected things. Do I plan to do more in the future? Yes, by the special grace of God, because to some extent, we are actually the government. So whatever 
as individuals, whether individuals or collectives, not in government, whatever it is we can do to help make our society better, we should do it. For joining us on news now at this time. Yes, we on the eight has protested in Lagos. Thank you for joining us again on the news. We have the state of Madison, the quality of service. So there's no need for speed. One vote will not. I think. And then the one point in Lagos spectrum frequencies. The bears took over the news on the Nigeria stock market today as sellers eased. I'm a visual artist and a photographer, but I major mainly in scribble arts, which I see um, as an art form born out of um, frustration. My very first scribble painting was done based on frustration. I was at Artist Connect in 2015, where I was challenged to actually do an art piece. and. I felt really frustrated because around that time I was just using pencil to work and I was handed a pen to draw. So I just started doing jaga jaga trying to find something from it and then along the line I realized I was actually just making sense. I was I could see a face in the painting I was doing. So um, I realized that there was something called scribble arts later on when I researched on what I had done at the Artist Connect. Scribble art basically, like I said, is an art, um, is an art form born out of um, frustration and me wanting to accept myself, me just accepting my flaws and me also creating sense out of nonsense and using um, this harmony to actually form harmony. So it's more of like me joining crooked lines together to actually make sense. It's just wobbling lines around to actually form, to actually form something, to actually um, arrive at the point. I can remember far back as um, secondary school in SS1. 
um, I was in biology, um, I was a science student in biology class then. I needed to like make some extra money for pocket, for pocket money. I was in the body now then and um, I could draw from my textbook. I could imitate things I could see. So my friends used to give me their works, biology assignments to draw skeletons and everything. So like most times whenever we have assignments, I'm the one they come to. So I used to do it and then I got into trouble. The biology teacher caught me, realized that all the works were looking alike and then she called me to the Staff, um, staff room. Around, the, around that time, the visual arts teacher too was around, so like he saw what was going on and he was like, ah, this girl can draw, she can even shade. Okay, she should actually come around to the visual arts um, class. So I enrolled for the visual arts vocational studies then. I was doing science and I was also doing art on the side. So I started developing interest because art to me was just for fun. I didn't really know that I had the gift. I just knew that, okay, I could just draw things and I realized that most of the times when I draw it was basically from what I was feeling at that time or basically because I just wanted to feel good so yeah that was basically how I started doing art. Initially, my inspiration basically was only from myself. I was inspired by my own journey through life, but along the line, I started gaining more interest in things around me. I started gaining more interest in history, I gained more interest in env my environment, I gained interest in my friends, like their stories, and um, yeah, governments too. I get interested, I'm interested in politics, the political aspects of um, Nigeria and the world as a whole. Okay, first of, I think being an artist first is an achievement for me because people are destined, people are people, people are born for greatness, yes, and people are, have been given different skills. Some people do hairdressing, some people do makeup, some people dance and all of that, but I'm really thankful to God for this gift that I have, um, which is art. So I see that as an achievement because it consoles me, fuels me up. And then secondly, I've, um, I was nominated for the Future Awards. Um, Africa last year which was very very surprising because I was nominated beside the people I see as my bosses so like being around those people and being the youngest amongst them was quite overwhelming and then I got I got some other nominations from um, Leading Women's Africa I was one out of hundred Leading Women's Africa most inspiring women in the world so like that's like the major highlights for like the awards I've won, there's also the one for creativity, most creative students in the whole of Unilag, there's one for most creative students in Africa, and yeah. Weirdly, I actually don't even count the number of artworks, but I have a list which I used to collect them. But I would say, in my lifetime, in my lifetime, I would say that I've created more than 500 works. I dance. Before I started doing art, I used to dance. Actually, dancing was my first love. I used to dance professionally, but I had to stop because my parents didn't find it. They didn't see it as a career as much as also the way they didn't see art as a career. So I had to just stop dancing. But it's something that I still wish to go back. And aside dancing, I also am a photographer. I take pictures. I also do short films. I 
that is something that I have mastered over time. It's something that I've practiced, practiced, practiced. Something that I can even do in my sleep, not even exaggerate. So like most times it's really not difficult because I'm the kind of person who sees or who gains inspiration from dreams. So there are sometimes when I'm asleep and then ideas just come and next thing I wake up, I draw. I already know what I want to do. And then there are times when it is actually very difficult. Times when my works actually challenge me. I do some particular works and it speaks to me in ways that I can't even explain. So times like that, I give the piece a particular period, say a year, before I go back to it. So there are times when my pieces challenge me, like when I'm doing something very personal. For example, when I had um, an atom done for my biological dad, it was really attacking because it just, just laid down questions that I couldn't answer personally. A scribble artist, uh, my own process is right, there's no direct path, it's usually in a scribbled form. Scribbled form is meaning it's a jaga jaga form. Because I'm seen as a jaga jaga artist, like I said, they see me as one person that just does nonsense, actually makes sense. So most times I twist and twirl before I actually make a point. Twist and twirl in the sense that um, I can decide to just get the sketchbook and then from a point I'm doing jargons all over, just doing jargons, not making any sense. And then it gets to a point where I actually realize what I am trying to do, the message I'm trying to pass across, and then I start building on that particular piece. So from that point, I'm already forming an image. I never finish an artwork. I never see it as a film, as a finished work. I feel like whenever I create an art piece, there's always going to be a continuation. And most times, it is when um, people get like buy the works off me that I call it finished because I no longer have it in my possession. But like sometimes I break down pieces into series because I can't finish one on a particular canvas, so I have to continue on another canvas. That is where. I, um, that's why there's need for co collection or series when I'm working. So, for example, my Igbo landing works. Um, this one behind me here, um, it's actually a series, a five-in-one series. John Michel Basquiat actually indirectly influences my style, he's a new expressionist, um, I also have interest in expressionism, I like his method and I feel like his approach towards creating um, has influenced me in so many ways because like I said earlier, I basically just approach the canvas and I see drawing on the canvas as me learning, I see it as an opportunity to learn, so whenever I draw, whenever I scribble, it's more like I'm actually learning, so that is how it is for Basquiat, so whenever he approaches his canvas, just basically scribbles paints around. He scribbles paints around and while doing that he figures out some things about what he's doing. So I think that's the same thing because I see art as a learning process. So he has impacted me in that form. Although Basquiat is dead, but yeah I still look up to him a lot. Challenges I faced as an artist um, at first it was acceptance, I was really chasing acceptance and I realized that at the point when I started getting accepted, I started losing myself because I wasn't, basically it felt like I was just doing works just to please people, just to please people's satisfaction and around that time I was doing that because um, I was doing, I was doing um, realism works, I was drawing faces realistically and then I realized that I wanted something more and in the process I started doing my own thing. I started doing scribble art. So yeah, at first it was acceptance, then there was the financial aspect. I mean, it takes a lot to get art materials, it takes a lot to get a studio. I got a studio um, late last year with my friend Bio, which I currently share with. Um, there's also uh, 
the whole art scene in Nigeria it's not so encouraging because I feel like um, they keep recycling old artists or dead artists and they are actually imagine artists doing so well. I have friends around that practice so well, they practice so well, their works are, they act, the works actually speaks to me and speaks to a lot of people and I feel like there should be room for them to, but it's kind of not so easy because there's politics everywhere, there's politics in the arts. My plans actually change over time because I'm human, I grow and I realize that sometimes I actually want stuff bigger and sometimes I want stuff a little more subtle, right? So um, currently I would like to actually have a hub where people like me wouldn't get the opportunity to create, wouldn't get the opportunity to study what they wanted to study, can actually come around and feel, and feel at home. Um, People who, people who probably find themselves doing things they really don't want to do can actually come home and meet other people, network, create. So there's going to be an art school, there's going to be a dance school, basically a creative hub where people can come around and learn. So that is like my dream. I would like to own a hub where people can do that, expose new talents, encourage them. And currently I've started doing that little by little with my NGO. It's called Charity with Arts. We go to the streets or we go to orphanages and then we teach kids out to draw. We don't only just feed them or give them clothes, we also teach them because if you like once you have a skill you already have you already have a weapon or you have your passports to the world, like to travel the world. So basically we just impact that knowledge and um, get them to practice more. Thank you for coming, sir. Yes. I was expecting the noise. Noise, the siren and everything. Can't I have a break uh, even for a few hours from this siren as well? <laughs> now, I, now I see why you want to come back here now. Yes. You can see this place is more friendly, isn't it, than Abuja? <laughs> wow. So how much, how much do you miss it? Why you are not here? Well, very much, very much so. That's why uh, when I come, I keep my eyes very wide open, as if it were the first time I'm coming. This is this uh, uh, fruit uh, bearing trees are, are growing very fast. Yes. So you ca you counting the days now? I am counting the days. Not even the months. <laughs> mm. 
what amazes me is that uh, if you know him now, to me is the same Buhari I knew. 1953. He's a good listener. He will uh, accommodate you, listen to you, and uh, he will never fight back. If you are not hardworking, if you are not honest, if you are not dedicated to your duty, don't come here, Mr. President. He takes your problem, it's his own problem. He, he, the ordinary people are his friends. And then Kaduna, you come and see them on, in, in his sitting room. They are not only in the sitting room, but they are on his dining table, eating with him. There wasn't any day you go to Sultan Road number one that you will not see people que queuing, and that he will not attend to you. When he goes to his farm, the only thing you know that he is not with them is of course of his white dress and height. He mingles with them. When we are going to the mosque, we, we, we enter the normal place where other people are and join the queue from where we find it. We don't overstay our queue. And normally, during, the, during Christmas or Salah, the father, buys a dress for his children. And from 1996, when I started working with him, up to this year, he will, he will buy me salad dress. Every salad. So I'll, along with his children. So I'll, I'll go, I'll have my own children, my own salad dress. When my mom passed away, we were going to hold a commendation service for my mother in Lagos and I just sent her some cards. I sent one to his house in Kaduna. Lo and behold, on the day he just, an SUV just drove into the premises of the hall and uh, I went to welcome whoever was in it. When he opened the door and I saw him, I was shocked. So you could make it. He laughed. And he stayed with us throughout that service, a Christian service. A man they used to call him Muslim bigot. He stayed throughout that Christian service. It was one of the things that convinced me that the man was not who people were saying he was. I first met him in 2007 because they were trying to meet pastors uh, who could also, and not only pray along with them, but who could identify with him to remove the toga of Islamic fundamentalism which uh, he has been labored with for too long a time. I saw him as a forthright person, an incorruptible leader, and one that uh, was ready to bring about discipline to a people who is not accustomed to being around, and he can live in his own skin and seek to carry it out. President. President Bahari, you go into his office, see him reading, let's say, a memo. He will not even notice you are there. He, did, he puts in his 100% on that memo until after he reach, or reaches the end of what he's reading. He does not even know somebody is there standing. We first met January 1953. Buhari, as a child, was quiet humble and reserved. There's one thing I also learned that you do the school for, for nine years. Three of the primary school and six secondary school. His father uh, passed away when he was four years old. 
His father had three wives. Uh, Muhammad was the youngest of 23. He had sort of surrogate fathers throughout his career, uh, including uh, within the military and including uh, within the school system. He was uh, brought up by his senior brother, who was a teacher. He is one of our teachers. So he had a good home training under the uh, care of his senior brother. President Buhari is my uncle. I'm his nephew. My name is uh, Amandaura. His mother, Hajia Zulehat Musa, is my grandmother. Her first child was my father. Her last child was Muhammad Buhari. My father was his guardian, but it was tough for him, but tough for us also. Life was very tough in those days. You went to school in the morning, you came back and you go to the bush, collect firewood for the night reading. We had no lamps in those days. We used firewood to light, uh, and we had slates, which we wrote chapters of the Quran and, uh, and read. And so you, you have one chapter, you read it uh, during the session, and then tomorrow morning you wash it, and another chapter or a piece thereof is written, and you, you learn it by heart. So when I was away from home, I think uh, I was constrained to behave myself because there was nobody to, to rescue me. So I was behaving myself. As I said, I became a, a class monitor. I, I, I became a junior prefect. I became a senior prefect. I became a head boy. You know, boys will be boys. Uh, you will transgress uh, on occasions you will be late for school, uh, refuse to attend uh, lessons sometime, go, go out to play, and that, that will be severely punished. Whoever did that will, will be punished. And uh, the teachers were, I wouldn't say harsh, but they were disciplined. They taught us discipline. If you transgress, grass, they lash you. There was discipline in schools look, then. There was there's corporal punishment. And I think, to a certain extent, it molded the minds of the children and so on and so forth. Um, our generation was very lucky. Our teachers were absolutely committed and dedicated. Mm. And they treated us, or they treated us like their own children. Mm. If you do well, you are praised. You are brought before the classroom, you are what you are shown and you are praised. If you don't uh, perform, you are again brought before the classroom, yes. stripped and flogged on the, on the buttocks. And uh, there is no way I can forget um, school because what we call the, the teacher I see there, called Mala Abdul, is a very strict person. And um, um, he doesn't spare the rod. We call it Bulala. Really. Um, we don't like the rainy season approaching because we have to go to school farm. You wouldn't be late there, just like a classroom. And if you are late uh, from six to, to two, you land on your buttocks. And you have to remove your uh, shorts so that uh, you get the message proper. Um, among the teachers, I could only again remember our Arabic teacher. No matter how hot it is, he comes in with a bag, with a turban. 
And uh, every week we are given to the side part of the Quran. Yeah. Every week. And uh, the only thing we can do with the body is to report sick. If we haven't recited the, the part given that week, and so we report sick. But even if you report sick, then you are stopped from going to a breakfast break until you recite the bath you are given in the class. Mm. I'm so, you didn't get too much, Bilala, because you are always like a leader in class. You will be very surprised. I bought a lot because um, I tried to avoid going to the school farm. And uh, if you miss it, you are not allowed to go on breakfast break. So you will, you will have no break until the school is closed. But what I uh, do between the first whistle and the last one, I go over the wall of the school, rush to home, and sometimes I'm eating up to the time I'm going to the classroom. <laughs> and there's no way one could forget those days. <laughs> Trying to be clever by half. <laughs> How did a boy from Daura end up in Liverpool, straight out of secondary school? I was picked from here, and then the whole of the north, again, I was the only person picked to go to UK, recommended to go to UK, Elder Dumpster. Elder Dumpster, nine, nine, uh, where I given uh, some slots for children from each region from the north, from the west, from the east then, and from Lagos. Four of us were taken. And uh, that's how I, how I managed. You can see the system then. Here in the in Katuna province, we are the junior part. Uh, in Daura here. But I was picked you know, from the whole of the north to go to UK for holidays. That's when my father visited to the UK. And um, what struck me when we arrived at Liverpool, we went to the center of the Liverpool. Some of the cities in London, then there's a, a central roundabout in the town. From there, you can go to other places. And uh, when we went down about break time, I saw people coming out. Everybody well dressed up, you know, just the way you are, but uh, almost three piece. Um, handsome, healthy, and then I reflected a street back here in Katana on my school days when I'm going to the mosque. On Fridays, blind men, cripples, leopards, mm. people in rags, begging for what to eat. So I say, God, how can we understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That impression is still there in me. Look at people coming out as if they made it up themselves. Very well dressed and something. Under development is terrible. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can say. He was interested in science at the time. He was thinking of becoming a doctor. You know, he was born in 1942, you know, sort of the end of colonial era in, in, in Nigeria. They, they didn't really have a medical school yet at, uh, at ABU. It turned out not to be a career path for him, although it was an interest. When he was finishing up secondary school, uh, the emir of Katsina, who was the neighboring emir to Daura, was encouraging young, you know, men from the north with leadership potential to go into the to the officers' training. The Emir of Kaduna then he sent Hassan. It was no longer a profession for the poor. My height was a disadvantage to me. He was, then there were cadets only in government colleges, Zaria, KP. I don't know how many in the south. 
the provincial secondary school, which was my school, they, are, they were not given uh, army cadets. But the Emir of Kaduna wanted to make a case to Lady Sardona that he wanted a cadet school, a cadet in, 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 in his secondary school in, in the state. So the Sardona told the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister told the Minister of Defense. And then Kaduna had a cadet, and then um, a retired oh, ex World War II veteran from Kaduna was made uh, to be in charge of the training. Just because of my height or something, I was picked to be the, the sergeant. So from there, I was impressed by the military discipline and so on. So when I left, I just went straight to, to, to the army. And he was very attracted with the idea of uniform, uh, discipline, and uh, extra curricular activities like uh, night uh, exercise and the drills that attracted him very much and he was eventually eventually plus he had a few friends like Sheikh Eradua uh, God uh, have mercy on him and uh, Jega Emir of Gondu and Magoro um, they were his classmates and they all started so that the hard instinct also had an influence in his decision to join the army. And he has never regretted it since. It must have been something for him. I mean, he went into the army to be a soldier. Then there was a political crisis, the coup and the counter coup, then the civil war. This is where the, the value of fighting for country comes in because at every point of his military training, he was taught, you know, you fight for your country, you die for your country, uh, and you do it with honor. Uh, and so the idea of splitting the country was it just sent shockwaves through these people. It was, even though they knew some of these counterpart officers on the other side. They never saw it as a, Buhari never saw it as, a, as an Igbo thing, as an ethnic thing. He always saw it as the rebels and the, and the attempt to, to split the country. His battalion, the second battalion, Nigerian army, he was number two in the battalion. They were the first to fire shots. A battle in which they were advancing and the, the opponents, the rebels, uh, shot at them and the fellow on his right was killed, the fellow on his left was killed, but he, he was unscathed. It was dreadful, dreadful. I, I was so afraid reading the dispatches to see the uh, casualties and I always poured over the casualty to see if his name was, was involved. The Biafran Civil War was one where you didn't know you, you were going to survive. They were hacking their way through the, uh, through the rainforest, and, and, which was very different than the dry savanna in, in the north. And his men had to uh, be sure to uh, take health precautions, They'd change their socks, not, not get fungus in their feet and uh, things. So, he, he was always concerned with the welfare of his men. Uh, I, I think even his critics would, would say this, that this was a, a young officer who took his leadership seriously. And if I tell you that I walked across Nigeria from Benue State, virtually up to the sea, when we were fighting the sea below, the 30 months of the Civil War, I was always in the front, within the small arms range for the 30 months. I was never relieved. But when I was sent to India and the United States subsequently to do my training, people were saying, why are you in Buhari? But when I was being sentenced to the front, nobody asked, why didn't they bring me back to their headquarters where they have time to drink and dance? 
This is Nigeria. <laughs> There was a bloodless coup today in Nigeria, which is black Africa's biggest and richest nation and the world's eighth largest oil producer. The overthrow of strongman Major General Yakabu Goan. Hello, Nigerians. Events of the past few years have indicated that despite our great human and material resources, so I had you met the then Colin Buhari when he was governor of the Northeast. Way back in the early 70s or mid 70s, I was a young student aged about 18, 19, and he was then governor of the Northeast. He was military governor of the Northeast and I was a young student activist as the secretary general of the Students' Union in the then Northeast College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, when Mutala was killed, I led the delegation of students uh, to protest the, uh, the killing of Mutala, demanding that the coup plotters uh, be brought to book uh, and be tried. Well, he was quite a very uh, serious looking military officer. And my impression of him was that he was somebody that was uh, destined for the future uh, to become an effective leader in this country. General Shehu Aradua, may, may God bless him, may Allah have mercy on him, told me how Buhari was made Minister of uh, Petroleum in Obasanjo's uh, government. They set the, the group who were naming ministers and governors and so on, and they said, who is the most honest <laughs> and the most serious among the officers of the Nigerian army? the one with the most integrity, and they, they honed in on Buhari. So they appointed him Minister of Petroleum, and uh, they all thought he would not get his hands dirty with <laughs> oil money. Indiscipline, corruption, squandermania, misuse and abuse of public office for self or group aggrandizement, which had assumed debilitating proportions in the last few years, will be dealt with ruthlessly, no matter whoever may be involved. It wasn't easy in the sense that um, I noticed a lot of things were going wrong, personally. Uh, People were looking for office just to be materially endowed or empowered. I thought it was wrong. I think leadership is a sacrifice. It was clear to the senior officers, including Bahari, that the junior officers were going to do something if they didn't. And the junior officers were taking their cue from next door in Ghana where Jerry Rawlings had just taken over, a young flight lieutenant in the Air Force, uh, and, and, and lined up and shot the previous senior military people who had been ruling the country. So the, the senior military people in Nigeria thought, we'd better stabilize the situation. Uh, we, we don't want another you know, Jerry Rawlings situation here. Buhari was not terribly keen. He wasn't terribly keen about it. But there was nobody to lead the nobody to lead the change of government. Nobody with the credibility and the integrity to uh, you know to convince the country that a change was necessary. It wasn't his uh, his, 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 his 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 choice. You need to emphasize self discipline and leadership by good example. 
begin by drawing public attention to little but important everyday manifestations of indiscipline, such as trying to impose discipline on the country. So it, it was a kind of a culture clash between military culture and the Nigerian uh, grassroots culture, if I may say. The night of the coup, you were with him, right? I was in Lagos and um, we had dinner and then we talked until about 11, 11 p.m. Then I went back to my digs. We, we had no idea, no inkling, whatever. Something was afoot. In the morning, one staff came and told me, look, there has been a change of government. Your uncle has been deposed. The coups in Nigeria have a history of being very violent and very bloody. So I pray to God that they don't kill him or injure him or something, uh, something of that nature. The people who know him well said he was aware, but the only way he could have prevented it was to execute, you know, uh, six or eight of the senior officers, and he wasn't willing to do this. I think he prevented a, a, a more serious situation because when you start killing officers, uh, you know, who knows where it's going to lead. Now he's down in, in Benin, he's under house arrest. He's living in a cottage uh, with guards. He, he figured that if, if Babangida wanted to kill him, he would be dead by now. So uh, it was... Uh, uh, really a question of just marking time and, and, and using it to, to realize, well, this is the end of his military career and it, it was uh, possible for people to visit him, but only with the permission of General Mabangida, who is now in charge. He was detained for three and a half years. I went to see him regularly every month uh, in Akure and in Benin. Uh, very restrictive and uh, it's very boring and uh, he didn't know what eventually the government would do uh, with him and he was only released on the death of his mother. But throughout I think his spirit never for a moment broke because so many people gave me messages to tell him to say please write to Babangida and tell him since he has taken over let him go. He said no I will not, never never write to him, I'll never talk to him. His uh, spirit never broke throughout the three and a half years. Even though Jonathan Abacha was part of the, the military elite that uh, toppled his government, uh, out of patriotism, you know, to save the government, he accepted to serve as the chair against the advice of uh, many of his uh, close associations. He said, no, it is not about Abacha, it is not about uh, toppling of the government, it is about the country. We need to save this country, we need the, the, the infrastructure has decayed. So he accepted as the chairman and uh, quickly he assembled uh, some uh, professionals, largely young men, and, uh, and, and we went into work. If you go down even to our hospitals to check, we see if you see linens that are curtains, you know, shielding the beds, besides the few procurements, you will see PTF inscribed. If you see the roads today and you go through from north to south, there hasn't been any corner you will go through without seeing the project of the PTF. If you see hospitals with equipments, basically even in the theaters today, you will see that you will have the little you know, inscription of the PTF.
nearly every week some delegation from different parts of Nigeria who are coming to see us in Kaduna saying, look, you have to come and take care of the, uh, have to come and lead this government. We are drifting. We are going back to the 1983 uh, period. And he resisted this for a long time until both political parties sent emissaries to tell him that if he wanted, they would give him the ticket to run for the presidency. He succumbed to the pressure. On, on Thursday, 26th of April, 2002, we went to Daura, where he registered as a Karkare member of the then APP. Uh, which is the second largest party uh, after PDP at that time. I think it was uh, 1 million, 145, 359. Yeah, that, was his, that, is, that is his number in the, 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 AAP, in the APP. I received a phone call and they said I should help them look for a vice presidential candidate. That's Christianers from the South. We couldn't make any headway, and we decided to lay, to lay down. Until January 15, at 12 noon, I received a phone call from the general. He said, I prayed my own way, and I want you to pray. I would like you to be my running mate. My first response was, Thanks, but no thanks, sir, because I'm heading a group and I've given them my word that I will neither join partisan politics or seek an elective office. But even within the group, they said, you have been positioning us for days. We are now saying you must take this. Long story short, sure, by the time I called, uh, Pastor Adeboye called everyone, contacted this and that, the rest is history. Uh, I had to team up with him to become his running mate. And it was such an experience that I cannot forget. Character, credibility, competence, integrity, those are the issues. And by the grace of God, 2011, we will have a new president. All the three elections were rigged, massively rigged. Let me give you an example. 2007, uh, after our lawyer made his uh, submission to the Supreme Court, I went to his office and I asked for the uh, results of just one of the states. He gave me results of emo states, emo states. I went over the, the, carefully over the results. And then they just say, PDP, that's Omar Eradwa, 25,000, Buhari, 5,000. Round figures throughout, round figures. The winner of the election, Omar Eradwa himself said the elections were faulty, if you recall. After you, you know you won in 20, 2003, rigged. You know you won in 2007, rigged. You know you won in 2011, changed, rigged. What will, what will you do? Spain is the third and last one for me. Since after it, I will not present myself again for election into the office of the president. So he just, he didn't break down in tears. He just uh, broke down in uh, pity for the system, for the country. And he said, I'll never do it again. Never do it again. So when this thing happened in 2011, it was worse than what had happened in 20, 
and 2007, it was, it was worse than what had happened in 20, uh, 2003. So it is this sin, it is not the bitterness that he lost that worried him. And then he said, well, it, it will appear now that nothing is going to change this sin. It's like, well, it's a country of over 150 million. Uh, I have tried my best. I have made my own contribution. Uh, my contribution uh, is not recognized. And surely it's better to keep off from this. This is his eldest daughter, Magazia. She suffered all her life uh, with sickle cell disease. And then a uh, confluence of events, a few uh, days with, with the announcement, she also died. So that, uh, that shook him very much. But I would say that he, the death of his daughter shook him more than the, the loss of the election. There is what they call sickle cell anemia. Um, uh, there are people who are SA, there are people who are SS. So I think when the developed countries found about this uh, sickle cell uh, disease, um, they try to stop marriage between AS or SS so that they don't have this sickle cell anemia. My first wife, my late first wife, um, unfortunately, I think she is SA or AS and I'm AS. So my, my two children, my first daughter and my first son, happened to be SSS and they died of it. It was hard, but uh, when I gave to my second wife, uh, I asked who introduced her to me that she must be AA. So that if my, if my child picked the S from me, he could only pick S from her, A from her. So AS is not normally susceptible to, uh, to the anemia. So in 2013, 2014, you decided to team up with the other opposition parties. How did that come about? The PDP. We are so confident that nobody could remove them. And I think they, they just ignored even being careful. So we persuaded the other parties the CPC, Congress for Progressive Change, which I was leading, the ACN from Southwest mostly, Abga from Southeast geopolitical zones. I said, and, until we came together, there was no way we could remove PDP. I persuaded them, they agreed, Aswaju, uh, Tinivu, from the North, uh, from, well, from CPC, this was myself, and then from the South East, Abga, Rocha Okorocha. So I, I we got people from uh, various parties to come together. Now you had a strong opposition party, but you almost got killed before the election. I think Kwan uh, Kwasu was very generous. He gave me an armored uh, vehicle, uh, a Land Rover. Uh, he said I should be using it because uh, he believed that uh, the competition I am about to, well, I am going on, 
I think there are people who really wouldn't like to to compete with me. They would like to eliminate me. I say, okay. So I had um, to go to Kano, and I somehow I, I was using that uh, jeep. And uh, a vehicle near the secretary, the federal secretary in Kaduna, wanted to overtake us. My escort stopped them. But uh, before we go on the, that overhead bridge, which was parallel to our filling station on the right as you are leaving Kaduna for Zalia, they just blew the thing. And when I looked, I saw the pieces of human beings. People who are, who are being blasted by the bomb. The chap who we are traveling with in the car on my left was thrown on my left because the, uh, the bag, you know, the, the, the crash bag, which is the vehicle have some of them. Uh, the one on my side was blown. The one on his side, I think, uh, was not blown, so he was thrown on my left. And when I looked, I saw blood on my trousers and on my gown. But none of us, the two people in the vehicle and two of us behind, four of us, none of us were injured. But somehow I saw blood because of the number of people killed outside and by the blood of the bomb. And uh, I came out, I was concerned with the dead people, but uh, some people stopped a vehicle, pushed me inside and drove me home. And that was the end of it. That's how efficient the Nigerian security agents are up to today. It is now my pleasure to hand over the certificate of return as prepared by the National Convention Planning Committee to the winner of the All Progressives Congress presidential primary, General Muhammad Buhari retired. Campaigns and we went around in buses a lot, you know. We traveled from state to state, you know. And I recall in particular, we were at a, I think it was in Zamfara where we saw these young people, and this always happened, of course, pressing themselves against the window of the bus that we were traveling, you know, shouting, say Baba, you know, Baba, you, you, and all of that. And, and he said, Look at the faces of these young people. He says, the expectations are high, very, very high. He says, and they expect us to do magic the moment we get into office, you know. Look at all of them. Here in Kaduna, we voted for General Muhammad Buhari, not because he's an ordinary or a Muslim, but because we believe he's going to bring change. He's going to stop the insecurity, the, corrupt, uh, the corruption, and the callousness and the impunity. that Muhammad Buhari of APC, having satisfied the requirements of the law and scored the highest number of votes, is hereby declared the winner and is in turn elected. Well, don't forget that I tried three times, 2003, I think 2007, and 2011. 
and I ended up in Supreme Court three times. The first time, I went to address the pressmen and some Nigerians that were very curious. I was expecting sympathy, but the group laughed at me. So I said, okay, good day. And God sent technology. With permanent voters card, PBC, it's very difficult, you know, to do what uh, Fulton used to do in Nigeria. Well, some of us will claim credit to the fact that we, we were popular, but key is the character of our candidate. First, his character was, was essential to salvage the country. The country was in so much crisis, financially, security-wise, in every ramification. This is the victory that is completely due to the support of the people. The normal elites, those who normally decide things, were all against this movement, and it came to victory. And I knew the country needed Buhari, and it has got it now. It is one of the best moments in my life. I didn't know I was going to be part of the government, but the fact that Buhari has won was just enough for me as a cause for happiness for this nation. I, I remember that very, very day when the, uh, the uh, announcement was made. He, 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 from his office in Lobito upstairs, he came down to my office. And I look at him, you know, in the very, he was looking in the ceiling in very pensive mood. After some one or two minutes, I say, sir, I will not like to congratulate you. I would rather pity you. He said, thank you. Thank you. So we went out, back to his office. He is a man of uh, inflexible integrity. He is also a very simple man, a very religious man, and also dedicated to Nigeria. If he has political views, is that Nigeria together is, is, is the best for all the peoples. He's a man of his words. He's a man of honor. He's a man of courage. He's a man of uprightness. He's an old nonsense man. He has never, for once that I know him, done anything that will advance his selfish interest, either for himself as a person, for friends, for family. He believes in the ultimate goodness of each and every Nigerian, including those of us who work with him. Yes, he will discuss challenges with you, but ultimately he always believes that, he, that you will do the right thing. Uh, Muhammad Buhari, he listens a lot. Uh, he is not too much in a hurry to take decisions. And uh, he is also very considerate. He said, Nigeria is a very complex place. You need to take measured decisions because every decision you take will impact on the lives of people. So, but he is a very, very thorough leader. Uh, there are so many adjectives you can use to describe Buhari, but truly, really, he is a leader whose time had, has come and uh, he has led this country very, very well. Under no circumstances, the leader will probably be sending his people or be asking you to do this for him. Buhari has never sent anybody to me in the last seven years to do anything for him or for the person. I have had the privilege of serving seven Nigerian presidents in my public career. Uh, the styles of leadership are different, the circumstances are different, but as a boss, he supports, he gives you the resources to do your work. You can say anything about uh, him or his policies, but nobody doubts his integrity and uh, his commitment to ensure uh, that public resources are, are very well managed uh, and that, that he cares about uh, all parts of the country including those that may not have voted for him conspicuously, not voted for him uh, in several elections that uh, he has undergone in this country. His driver took me from 
his house to go to Governor Erufai's house. And when we got to Erufai's house in Kaduna, his driver said, Daddy was referring to me, I'd like you to pray with me. I said, I beg your pardon, he said, I call you Daddy, I said, I do not pray the Muslim prayer. I can only pray for you as a Christian. He said, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of Equa Church and I'm born again. I've been driving him for 10 years. This is the third or so uh, electoral process that I've driven him. I said, you are a Christian? He said, yes. I prayed with him. That was very shocking to me. Second thing that I received as a shocker, <laughs> a serious shock, we did the first uh, flag off in Kaduna. It was such a mammoth crowd. And if anyone would be pushed that day, there would be a serious stampede. And then after the flag all, we go to his home and he's staggered. And he said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I said, excuse me, sir? Because I would have said, is that a swear word? And he looked at me and said, Pastor, you don't have monopoly of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I said, okay. I calmed down, I left it. Then we were in Abuja, and Ali Monia was going to his uh, hotel apartment, presidential suite at Transcorp Hilton, and I met his bodyguards at the door. And one of them said, good morning, sir. A good morning, daddy, I said. Why do you call me daddy? He said, you are a grandfather, actually, because our pastor is your son in the faith. We go to Lighthouse. And I say, what kind of a man is this? Never at once try to hinder uh, my faith or to try to say, to be irritated by me. And all around him, a cook and this and that were Christians. So how do you come with Abuja? If this is, if Dara is noisy sometimes. No, Abuja, I'm effectively protected by security and COVID-19. You see? Uh, security wouldn't allow people to be seeing me in the same pool of COVID. So I am thanking the security and COVID. <laughs> Where do you find the energy? You'll be 80 in December. Yes. You walked from the mosque today. Mm -hmm. You walked almost an hour now. So where do you find this energy? I mean, I'm younger and I'm tired. <laughs> yes. You, if you were a village man like me, you, I think you would have been stronger. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a crazy one that was going around at one time that you are not Buhari. Did you hear about that one? Yes, people said that I'm somebody from Sudan. They even mentioned the name, I didn't bother. Nigerians, when they don't understand things, they create their own mysterious way of uh, explaining themselves. Does it help that you have your sense of humor to find those things funny? No, it's not funny because uh, those who are advocating or who are making those statements, they just want to be cheeky. They want to distract attention from the main issue. Our main issue is uh, do the infrastructure, uh, make people aware that uh, they need to work hard to live well. They just can't, uh, you know, enjoy life for, uh, without earning uh, the respect of their communities and so on. After you leave the presidency, yes. what are you going to miss the most about the presidency? I wonder if I'm going to miss much. I think I'm being harassed. I believe uh, myself that I'm trying my best. But still my best is not good enough. Because there are people around that uh, think that they can intimidate authorities to get what they want instead of going through establish systems, you know, and earn whatever they want to earn. There are still people who want to, who behave, uh, who are clever by half, let me put it that way. When I left secondary school, 
I came back here. This is my base. Who counter who? Civil war? Who counter who? Detention? I have gone through it all. I have tried hard enough. I think I have tried hard enough. The results are obvious, and uh, uh, I'm praying very hard that uh, I will end up well. Technology continues to advance globally. Nigerian youths are ensuring that they take the center stage of the fast-paced world of innovative inventions. From creating impressive programs to inventing new products, Nigerian youths are daily enhancing the quality of life and entrepreneurship that has a huge impact across Africa and the globe. Hello and welcome to another episode of Startups with me, Apisola Adebayo. On the program today, we'll be talking to two of these geniuses that are using technology to enhance the country's development. In Ayo State, Southwest Nigeria, Olushola Ayola has established a center to train Nigerians on robotics and artificial intelligence. And in Lagos, Onyeka Owika has created an application that helps save power consumption. How exactly are these guys able to do all of this? I'm just as curious as you are, but we'll be finding out in just a moment. What rain does is the first of its kind in Nigeria and perhaps in West Africa because we receive applications from Egypt, Liberia, Ghana and so on. Um, we do training and certification in robotics and artificial intelligence, which is the future. And developed countries are already beginning to struggle to take a position there. So normally Africa or Nigeria should just wait for all of that to be developed first before we take interest. But Ren is saying no to that.
My name is Dr. Olushola Ayola. I'm the founder of Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Nigeria. Artificial Intelligence, AI, is the technology of making machines perform tasks considered possible only with human intelligence. This technology has ushered in tremendous opportunities leading to leapfrog development and attainment of economic growth and prosperity across developed and developing nations of the world. However, in Nigeria, the giant of Africa, the pace of innovation and artificial intelligence adoption has been slow, mainly due to the lack of adequate knowledge about the technology. Having lived and schooled in the United Kingdom for years, helping the country with developing ground and underwater robots and artificial intelligence. Olushola Ayola decided to return home and help his home country with the skill set and experience is acquired. This electrical engineer was determined to prove that AI can improve the livelihood of Nigerians only if there can be enough Nigerian-based experts in the promising field. In 2019, he founded Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Nigeria RAIN, a foremost training research and innovation center focused on the creation and development of artificial intelligence enabled technology. I mean, when I was uh, done with my PhD and I was done with saving and I was done with working there, even though I was working in a robotics company that was helping the UK government to decommission their nuclear storage sites. Um, I felt it was time to go and develop that skill in Nigeria for my people. Because many times when the UK needs to get a particular robot built, they do the design there, they send it to China. So China guys would actually build the robot and send it back to the UK. And I felt, wait, why can't they send it to Nigeria? Because after all, I'm the one in the company that China will send it back to and I'll try to get it back to standard. Unfortunately, whenever I tried to contact me in Nigeria, do you know how to use this? Do you know how to use that? They all say no. We're not taught. Uh, we were not taught, or we were not taught very well, or we don't remember it because we've not been practicing it. So I thought, let's have a new kind of education system where we get projects to do, we get people to train, and we get research to do. So it's all busy. It's like a Silicon Valley of ideas here in Nigeria. And so we set it up. If we had said you can only come to Rain if you are a computer science graduate with two one or anything, we will be limiting a number of people. Because you would agree with me that many people are very good when it comes to hands-on, but may not be good when it comes to WAC or NECO or all those jam exams. And so, for us at RAIN, to get into RAIN to study, you need to be above 15 years old. So that means you should have finished secondary school and you should have a credit pass in your mathematics at all levels. That's it. Ayola prides in the quality of training and infrastructure RAIN offers its trainees. He says the plan is to compete with standards from developed nations and produce the next generation of AI experts to contribute to the country's development. It's been a series of Eureka moments like, wow, we did it again, we did it again. Typically in Nigeria, and this is one thing we have learned a lot from the experience in the past, you don't set up a, an institution to look like the normal African standard, Nigerian standard, you have to raise the bar. So we were not competing with anybody in Nigeria. We were competing with the standards I met in the UK, which, I, which were my vision for, my, for Nigeria. You know, a school that is homely, teachers, the, the, the teachers are friendly, the environment is friendly, you have a hangout spot, you have a kitchen, you have relaxation, games and all of that, then you have internet. You have power supply, you have facilities like you have the kind of ambience that makes you want to learn. You have projectors, you have all of those, you know, all of those IT uh, facilities that will encourage students to want to learn. We have all that. RAIN is actually taking care of unemployment in the future by providing the skill that the government or the people need. That's one. Secondly, RAIN is helping to attract foreign investment because just by having a pool of talent in the area of AI, you're, you're a leader, global leader. Now, when people look for AI solutions globally, they just go on Google and search artificial intelligence developers across the world, and RAIN puts Nigeria on the map. Since establishment, RAIN has been experiencing a steady growth. 
Ayola says students in the tech field are eager to enroll and is also been receiving partnership proposals from the government, local and international bodies. Beyond this, the institution has been building and developing impressive artificial intelligence products. It's, it's been growth upon growth as we've been going. At first we were training only and then later we started doing research for people and now we are doing product development. So it's like we keep going higher. Of course investors have been coming as well to say can we buy this company off you? Can we take over? Can we expand it quickly enough? And I'm like let's just all calm down. Let's see where we're heading because I can't quantify the worth of the company until we get to a point where I can see everything from up there. We've uh, had you know, business deals, project deals with major companies. I can't mention their names now, but then about three major companies. One is on drone for parcel delivery, another one is on energy management, and another one is on waste management. Now, uh, this is to say a few, because we have other engagements with government in some areas that we cannot talk about. But then, for us, it's a milestone because we started off as a training institution, and now we are moving into product development. You know, And this, the, this is the curve that if we can continue in that trajectory, we, the, 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 there is no way saying we've got to that to, to the end point yet. We haven't. But these achievements did not come on a platter of gold. Ayola says setting up rain was not a walk in the park, especially in a country where electricity is a luxury. You know, money is never enough. You want to set up a world-class institution. You're competing with people who spend billions and trillions to set up same thing. So how do you set up same thing? with lower and lower budget. That was the biggest challenge for me. How do I make this place look expensive even though I'm not spending all of that money? Because I'm not the richest in Nigeria to be able to set up something like this. People walk in here and say, wow, billions have gone into this. Well, yes, billions, but not billions in money, but billions in ideas. Because my first challenge was, I must make this place look like a billion has been spent on it even if I don't have that. And that was the first challenge, we did that. We did that very well. Then the second challenge is the power aspect. We run on 24 hours power. We can't do without power here. This is not a place where power will go off and everybody will be like, let's just wait for never to bring light. We, have constant, we must have constant because we do 3D printings. And 3D printings you dare not wait for any second, otherwise you might lose the entire quality. So we do a lot of work, we do a lot of research, interfaces, meetings and all of that, and we need power. So the challenge there has been, how do we maintain steady power? The concept of generator, uh, solar and all of that have come, but they can't meet our needs. We just need constant power from the government. But that's going to be a thing of the past now, because we are working on a project with uh, a UK company on developing uh, homegrown power solutions. And it's going to be a very large project. So one of the big power engines will be dem uh, domiciled here at RAIN for demonstration and all of that. Ismail Surajo is one of the student trainees at RAIN. Surajo used to be a self-taught technician in his little village of Rubochi in Kuje Area Council of the Federal Capital Territory, where he's been inventing locally made tractors and machines. Surajo got a scholarship to study at RAIN in 2020 after inventing a local water provider in his village. In less than two years, the 23-year-old is now developing smart water meter. I've learned how to program using my system. When I was in school, I can build a car. I would be the one to control it. But now, I can use my system to control it. I intend to become an engineer in robotic design. I can design a robot that can help the community to solve some problem. I make water, smart water control device. Once you put your card, it on the water for you. You can subscribe on my own water device. I have other projects I'm going to work on. Uh, it's been sponsored by one of the people in government because he was given an award by the president in November 20, uh, 2020. And now he's developing solutions that will benefit his community directly. He's building a, wa a smart water meter that people in the locality can just slot in their card, their smart card, and water is dispensed in their pocket. So that way, what he's trying to do is to encourage lawmakers or people in government to donate boreholes to communities because the people will not take it for free, they will pay a token 
using that smart meter, uh, smart water meter, and by using that token, the money for maintaining that facility, that water infrastructure, is is provided. Ayola has indeed paid his dues in starting up rain. His vision is to make an impactful change in Nigeria's development pace and education sector by imparting his knowledge and skills of artificial intelligence. And the company's milestone so far shows he's right on track. To give rain about five years or less, and you'll be surprised that many things we look for outside would be produced in in house, and it's not going to be rain only. It's going to be offshoots of rain, uh, people that rain has actually promoted or uh, produced, and they are the ones that would begin to solve these problems. So if you look at ten years from now, you will see big entrepreneurs saying, um, "I decided to set up this business after my training at rain." And I figured out that this was a major business need for the country. And of course, there, there, there you go. So we are really helping the country to prepare for the future now. The structure we've set up, fine, AI and robotics is not new in the world. But the structure we have set up for AI and robotics, no facility in the world has set that up. Where you do training and certification, where you do robot, uh, research and projects for everybody, not for your company. For example, Toyota, they have the Toyota Research Institute where they do research in AI and robotics for their company only. But we are now setting up something that does AI and robotics research and product development for anybody. So what that means is that we are taking this to people's homes. So in the future, Rain may be not a Nigerian-based company any longer, but a global body competing with the likes of SpaceX, and so on. Because we have all of that model embedded in what we are doing. The technological advancement of any society is inched on its ability to invent and innovate as these are the cardinal bedrock upon which development is built and sustained. With RAIN's drive to nurture and train the next generation of AI experts in Nigeria, one can say the country is well on its way to achieving sustainable development. excited for the country I mean imagine the potentials of these experts that rain will be churning out anyways this next innovator will blow your mind with his invention you wouldn't even need to lift a finger to reduce your power consumption and control a lot of home appliances Okay, at Ving Global Technologies, we create solutions for humans with our full home and office automation. And we do that with our OVO products and our OVO Smart app, where we make life easy for everyone. They can have total control of their home, their offices, and their hotels. And they can do all that without a human intervention using our OVO Smart app. They can control everything in their home and save the cost of their electricity bills. They can know who comes into their home at every given point. They can turn off the electrical appliances and every of the appliances at anywhere they are in the world. My name is Onyeka Onwoka. I'm the CEO of Ving Global Technologies Limited. Computer, turn on bedroom lights. Okay. 
Who would have ever thought that in decades to come in Nigeria, words of mouth will be able to control gadgets without having to move an inch? From carrying out big tasks to attending to manual errands, engineers across the world are leveraging technology to make life easier for people. One of such innovative engineers is Onyeka Owuka, a 32-year-old graduate from the National Metallurgical Training Institute in Anambra, Southeast Nigeria. Bothered by the high energy consumption plague in his country, Onyeka decided to establish Vin Global Technologies, an engineering technology outfit, under which he developed a comfortable solution to help people control their home and electrical appliances from anywhere in the world through an automatic systemic app. He calls it the Ovo Smart application. It has been a very long time I started um, developing this app. And the reason why I started developing it was I've seen people leaving their home appliances on. They left their home appliances on and went out and then came back and started complaining about their electricity bills being piling up, forgetting that once it's turned off, your electricity bills won't be reading. So I started looking for a way to help people do all that. I've seen people turn on their gas on and leave it then they forget to turn it off they might they might be carried away seeing a movie or they be they might be carried away watching um, social media so um, i started looking for a way to help people do all that without human intervention i started looking for a way to help people turn off their appliances off turn off their gas then that was what led me to create the over smart app Let's say if you want to control the light, you buy our over switch lights. When you buy it, you don't need to change your bulbs, just the controller. So you buy the light and then remove, you don't need to break your walls. You, all you need to do is to change the fittings. If you, if you already have the old fittings, the manual fitting, you just change the fittings and then use our fitting. So once you use our fitting, you sync it with the OverSmart app and then from there you can control your lights. If you want to control your gas, we have our gas controller that you can use in your gas cylinder. Then if you want to control your TV, you use our, our IR, the, our Ovo IR controller to control your TV. You can use it to control your um, AC. You can use our Ovo water heater switch to control your, your water heater. You can also use our gate controller to open your gates and close your gates. Vin Global Technologies will make sure your security is intact. Vin Global Technologies will make sure that your electricity bills is being slid down to 60%. Vin Global Technologies will make sure your comfort, you have your comfort is what you need. It will, it will make sure that you have comfort, total comfort. And make sure you have that easy lifestyle. By connecting their devices to the OVO Smart app and the internet, users can control them all without moving an inch. All they need is a voice command, smartphone, or fingerprint. Onyeka says the OVO Smart app is connected to all the OVO products designed by his team. The customers then connect the product to the appliances. When the customer then orders the app to do a task, it gets notification once the task is completed. What our OverSmart app does is uh, whenever it does any command being said by you, it will give you, it will notify you that it has done it. So let's say someone comes to your home and you unlock remotely once the person gains access, it will notify you on your phone that the person has already gained access. So you can see the person with your over camera and you can have a conversation with the person. And uh, you, once you turn off your gas as well, it will notify you that your gas is being turned off. So it doesn't just turn it off and leave you blindly. So once it, it does the command you set, it will notify you immediately that it has done this for you even hotel owners they use our our sensors once uh, you have a guest and the person check in you can see it will notify you that you that a guest just checked in in your room 
So it notify you uh, as a hotel owner, you don't need to be in the hotel to know, to ask your management what rooms we are fully occupied. Is my rooms fully booked? So from your Ovo Smart app, you get notification. You get notified that your rooms, if it's fully booked, you will get the notification. If um, 20 rooms we are booked, you get notification. So all those things you get notification from anywhere you are in the world. Onyeka launched the Ovo Smart app in 2020. Working in a country where electricity is not stable, it says achieving this feat was not a walk in the park. You know, developing an app, you have to do the graphics, you have to write the codes. So I, I did all that with my team. Uh, in my team, I have a graphic designer that designs the graphic that I need to do. Um, the um, commands, I, I wrote the commands on my own. So the challenges I was facing that time was uh, I need to always stay strong. The challenges I was facing was um, the power issue because uh, I have to test my app with a generator and also test my app with um, the power uh, from the government. So if I want to test it, I'll have to wait for the lights to come so that I'll test it. So those were the challenges I was having at the moment while developing the app. But after all, all who said and done, it came out a success. I'm trying to set up the internet to to be able to run the program using a minimal internet to charge in kilobytes and not in megabytes. So with a thousand naira subscription, all your appliances will be running. And we also try to, to make it work with every internet providers, like MTN, Airtel, Etisala, every internet providers, we also try to make it work with all that. Since the launch of the application, Onyeka says he and his team continues to work to improve on the application and introduce more features to make life easier for customers. Uh, we have our competitors and that is why we are working hard every day to make sure we give in the best quality. Um, when we started our app, there was no um, virtual assistant. What I mean by virtual assistant is using your voice to control everything. You know, it's not every time you go to the app and start scrolling, looking for the light that is on and off. So um, we brought in, because as each day goes in, we, we keep on pushing, pushing. And now you can sync our over smart app with your Siri, with your Google Assistant, with your Alexas. So we keep on bringing the best every day that is why we work hard to make sure we are at the at the face of everyone since the oval smart app broke into the market vin global technologies have continued to record accelerating growth and even though the tech firm is yet to get a major investor it now has over 20,000 customers across africa when at first when we brought it out on social media few people came to patronize us they saw that it was good and they started spreading the the news they started spreading everything letting people know that we are using this thing like our smart locks there are people it has been people have been using it for two years two and two years plus without no issues so you don't need electricity to run the smart app it uses a finger battery so after one year, you, all you have to do is to change your finger battery. So people started advertising for us, people we don't even know. They started advertising our product for us because they've used it and it's working. So um, we started, um, the, we have influencers that helps us to do all that as well. Uh, and when the influencers does that, people use our product and see that it's, it's of good quality because we choose quality over quantity. So people saw that our products were of good quality and then that was how the marketing level started. We, we, we started moving from places to places, going to real estate developers, showing them what we have and from that we keep on that was how we started expanding. Right now, we don't have investors at the moment, but we have um, up to um, 23,000 plus customers. We have a lot of customers uh, that are patronizing us already. 
and we have more coming each day. We, we have um, customers coming from South Africa, from Ghana, from Cameroon, from Syria alone, from Nigeria. We have people buying our product from all these African countries. We don't have investors at the moment. But our product is going because it's of good quality and all our products are two years warranty. Onyeka says the future projection is for his innovation to break into the international market and in extension save Nigerians from bogus electricity consumption which makes them pay more. In the next four or five years, I, I want our, our company, Ving Global Technologies, I want my company, Ving Global Technologies, to be talk of the world. I want us to be the number one in automation system and all that. I'm making sure that every home, offices and facility have our products all over the world. At a time when authorities in the country continues to seek a lasting solution to energy consumption and increased electricity tariff, Onyeka's innovation, if expanded, might be the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm actually impressed by the good work these guys are doing to improve technology in Nigeria. Anyways, this is where we'll be signing out on the program today. Until I come your way next time, I'm Abisola Adebayo. Bye. Whether you call it democracy or election result, different from the real one. Or transmission, transfusion, transition, different from transparency. You are not far from the truth. But I hope the government will truly be a town hall different from Bala Blue. In 2007, late President Yaradua, in his inaugural speech, admitted that the election that brought him to office was far from being perfect. And subsequently set up the retired justice who weighs Committee on Electoral Reform. Whatever happened to the robust recommendation of that report that the appointment of INEC chairman, national commissioners, and resident electoral commissioners shouldn't be the sole prerogative of the president, today nobody is bothered again. And yet, we expected an election different from Balablu. Anyway, then our topic for another day. Even though, also, like the 2007 election, I'm aware that just like Professor Maurice Wu's promises, of conducting credible election. Professor Mahmoud Yakub's promises along the same line fell even lower than the expectations of Nigeria. However, because of the constitutional presumption of regularity in favor of INEC result as declared, I therefore congratulate everyone that has received a certificate of return, including Mr. President elect Bola Mes Tinubu, while hailing the courage and resilience of those that have proceeded to the tribunal. I say at the end of the day, may Nigeria win. I've seen videos of the president-elect visiting captains of industries, former military leaders, and some traditional rulers, either with a certificate or without. But I want to urge him also to extend this visit to both Christians and Muslim clerics in the South because of the fears entertained in some quarters over his Muslim-Muslim ticket. Because we certainly cannot shy away from the fact that our country have been so fractured along religious, tribal, and language fault lines, which also is patently reflected in not only our national life, but showed massively in the voting pattern and, and the complaint thereafter. 
Let him not be like Buhari who, who promised to belong to everybody and nobody, but ended up allegedly belonging to nobody but a few certain kabars. Anyway, no be me talk about. Why Tenobu is on his visit? I hope he has selected his team. He should immediately set out his economic team to ensure timely realization of his blueprint and realizable action plans and program with actualization dates and timeline to enable us follow up and also determine KPI as he has promised to hit the ground running. Make it not be like Buari when he hit the ground and started running away from the ground. Well, since Buari is hardly aware of anything, I also hope he should be aware that there is massive suffering in the land occasioned by his party's failure to fulfill their promises to the people. Even though his party, no grise, they fail. But at least now, the intentional decapitalization policy of a Mefele CBN has for once united both the politicians and the people as complainers. Everybody they complain, no money. Even as the Naira is falling headlong and the country has become so unsafe to live, so he should put aside politics and strive to truly protect and provide for both those that gave him 95% vote and those that gave him 7% vote, if you know what I mean. He need not be told that the country need to diversify its economy away from oil now more than ever before and truly ensure that NMPC is in words and indeed a profit-making ventures like the Saudi Arabia Aramco oil companies that just posted a profit of $161 billion in 2012. 2012, I mean to say. Also, with the prevailing economic hardship and the feeding bottle system of government we run, where states run to Abuja to share money every month, the reformation of the concurrent and exclusive legislative list and enhanced general welfare of the people deserve his urgent, urgent attention now more than ever before. We also cannot overflog the fact that his government need to create massive employment for a teeming youthful population and find way to not only export cassava, agbado, grains, and other agricultural produce, but also provide electricity that will enhance processing of these goods, boost food availability, industrial job creation, and improve manufacturing. Lastly, his government needs to ensure a statutory declaration that will ensure gender equality and participation in government, improve the security of lives and properties, and foster a truly renewed hope different from Bala Blue. May I also draw his attention to the fact that the undermentioned critical areas of our national lives need serious attention and revamping like yesterday. The Land Use Act, elevation of the value and dignity of the lives of every Nigeria above its current palace state, fiscal federalism, state policing for a subsidy, our population census, local government, legislative and judicial autonomy, separation of religion from the state, issues of terrorism, kidnapping, open grazing and banditry. You name it. Don't just tell me the list is too much. Add your own as the team. Plenty. After all, he begged for the job. I will therefore advocate that until the incoming government builds bridges to unite diversify the economy and rekindle true hope in the people. And the people also put their government on their toes to deliver on their campaign promises. Soon, we will not only be talking about a town hall different from Bala Blue, but our country will not be different from a Bala Blue. However, irrespective of our misgiving, we must collectively push, pressure, and work to make Nigeria succeed. Anyway, make I stop here for now until next week. But don't forget to follow us on all our social media platforms shown on your screen and let us know if you agree or disagree with us. But in all, let's always be decorous. Lastly, I leave you with this. Never be afraid of your government. Instead, let the government be afraid of you. See you next week.
Top of the morning to you, Nigeria, and welcome to What's Your Take? My name is Dayo Akintobi, and I will be taking you through all the big stories that made the headlines last week. Well, this has been a glorious week um, and a glorious month, a couple of months in Nigeria's history. The elections have come and gone. They are done and dusted. We can relax and breathe again at long last. As you know, the governorship elections held uh, this last Saturday. Uh, the winners, some winners have been declared and some losers are busy um, taking in their loss. As we speak this morning, some are experiencing the thrill of victory and others are suffering the agony of defeat. That's what politics is about. You win some, you lose some. In any political contest, there will be a winner and there will be a loser. However, there have been some firsts in this election that goes to show that our democratic process is deepening and it is progressing. For the first time, uh, we've almost had a female governor. As of this time yesterday, it looked like the APC candidate for Adamawa, a female, was actually going to be our first elected female. However, the news coming out this morning seems to show that uh, the PDP may have taken that state. Nonetheless, whether she gets there or she doesn't get there, she made an extremely good showing, which for the fact that it is even a state in the north that is predominantly a patriarchal society, it is a very good development for our democracy that she had such a good showing. In addition, we also have a reverend for the first time in Benue State, which is a predominantly Muslim state, a Christian reverend has become the governor-elect in Benue State. That is progress. It goes to show that religion is not the primary criteria by which voters now make their voting decisions. And then back in the south, we have what we call the happy hour governor in Akwa Ibom State, which <laughs> has been a joke all through this last week because the PDP candidate in the run-up to the election promised that if he were elected, he would make sure that every Friday uh, drinks would be sold at cut rate price prices all through Akwa Ibom State. Yet today, my newscaster, are we moving our studio to Akwa Ibom <laughs> State from next month? I think we are we should. recording this show from there so we can get cheap and free drinks? What are you doing? It. I'm, I'm actually considering that. Yeah, actually considering that. Well, mm -hmm. we'll pack up this studio and move right along with you. How have you been and how was your weekend? Did you uh, vote? Uh, how was your voting experience? My weekend has been well. My voting ex experience as well was very smooth and very easy. It took less than five minutes, just as the last presidential elections. Um, I wouldn't say it was the same for other areas because my friends that stay in VGC, they came, woke up as early as 8 a.m., went to the polling units, and they were told three hours after waiting to come back the next day, which was a Sunday, and they spent their whole days there before they were able to vote. So... That's yeah. what I have to say about Yes, that. yes. We have reports of isolated and sporadic incidents of uh, violence, of uh, uh, irregularities, mm. of uh, INEC shortcomings. So we can't say the election was perfect. We can't say it was seamless. But at least we've got it done. Winners are starting to be declared. And Nigeria will move on. And we will heal from all of the division, the hate speech, um, mm. the divisiveness, the rancor. We'll pick ourselves up and move on. And hopefully all the new people who will take office May 29 will do their very best to improve the lot of the masses in Nigeria. Now, having said that, um, before we introduce our guests, uh, there's another interesting story we should talk, touch on briefly. And this is how the people in the city of Shagamu, Ogun State, have found themselves having to travel to Ikorodu, and in some cases Ijebode, to go and uh, queue for cash. because. In their wisdom, they burnt down all the banks in Shagamu in protest <laughs> of the Naira scarcity. So who is now paying the price for those burnt banks? They are traveling to Ikorodu. And guess what? When they go to Ikorodu on Friday, the Ikorodu people say, welcome. We're happy you're here, but go to the back. <laughs> you will not collect money before us Ikorodu people go to the back of the queue. So please let us think about the fallout of the things we do before we do them. You burn the bank and it's to your own detriment. So now you don't have anywhere to collect cash in Shagamu. You're not having to go all the way to Ikorodu and then go and take your place in the back of the line behind the indigents who got there 
before you. All right. So that was just a lighter look at some of the things that happened. Let's get into the more substantive issues. Joining me to take a look at the big stories that made the headlines last week is Kolade Stephen Adeni, popularly known as Coach K. Coach K is an experiential learning coach. Wow, that sounds like a very big title. Experiential <laughs> learning coach who is the MD of 361 Degrees Limited, where he functions as a performance improvement and life coach, as well as a business psychologist. Welcome to What's Your Take, Coach K. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dick. Well, thank you for um, letting me be here. Uh, I think I like your warm, your warm start on the entire news about the Shagamu people burning their banks. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's just very interesting. Um, I know we are yet to get into the art of the conversation, but I think it's a good place to start from, mm -hmm. which is that um, it's easy for you to be, um, to, to be a party of, to the bandwagon effect or find yourself being lost in the concept of the ed, ed, ed mentality yes and you just follow the ed um and at that level emotions are are rife people yes. are not really thinking right. they're just going on with the energy that presents that presents itself and yes. um even if it's a negative energy. oh yeah definitely oh definitely like which is like i said uh, one of the things i like to start with and I think a viewers also should should be mindful of mm -hmm. is the concept of um, what I call the E plus R formula equals O. And um, if we take that into cognizance, then our actions and our responses will be different because it simply states that your emotion mm -hmm. plus your response equals your outcome. Wow, fantastic. We will bring you back here to come <laughs> and teach us all about experiential <laughs> learning. Meanwhile, over to you yesterday to give us the very first big story of last week so we can talk about this. Governorship elections. Incumbents keep grip on power in battleground states as INEC begin declaring results. Violence, thuggery, and voter intimidation mar polls in some states. Governors Makinde, Somwolu, Abiodu, Yahaya, Abdul Rasak, Zulum, Buni, others win second term. Over to you, Dio. All right. Okay, Coach K. Well, um, I don't know what your take is on the entire general elections from the presidential three weeks ago to the governorship yesterday. But as I said in my opening monologue, bottom line is the elections are done and dusted. Done and dusted. We have a new crop of leaders, although mm -hmm. the results are still being announced yeah. from the governorship one. But we have a new crop of leaders. What would you like to see from the new people who will take power in May 29th? compared to those who are going out now what what do you, what are your expectations of our new crop of leaders um without thinking i think this one is a no-brainer so i think the missing nexus between leadership and the people is accountability i think that's one thing that was deeply missing for the outgoing executives either at the state level as governors or vis-a-vis uh, -vis even the president um i think there was a lot of lack of accountability um and i think if we look at human nature in itself with regards to people you find out that the lack of people being accountable for what you promise to do uh what you deliver and the fact that even when you do things out of what you promise you see the need for you to tell people that um these are the reasons for this action and this is how it will impact um case in point Case in point, the Lagos gubernatorial race, which became interesting between the incumbent and, of course, the um, the out-of-the-blue candidate who mm. gave us another three-legged three -legged horse race in Lagos. Yes, Labour Party. Uh, Labour Party contestant. Can, the contestant. And then you would suddenly realize that it became an issue more because the same governor that didn't show, that could not, and I'm picking my words carefully, that could not show up for the debates, for the um, gubernatorial debate across across the state, suddenly found out that in, in two weeks, he needed to be accountable all of a sudden. And then which also now brings to fore the conversation that if you've done your job so well, then you don't need to explain to people that uh, your job was well done. They will see. They will they know. Should see they it. should know. It they should, should be automatic. See so which of course now also now brings to bear the fact that the people who are the minders, the media minders of the governor, apparently should be um, should step up their game 
and then they should be held responsible because if the governor has done so much how come that the narrative is not directly impacted on the people um we of course i grew up of course you'll be very familiar that we grew up with the mamsa with, with the with the mamsa logo where we knew that it was mass mobilization people were heavily sensitized so and i think also that is another thing we're still talking about accountability accountability that the current government or the incoming government must make very very must make um an imperative otherwise we find ourselves going back to the conversation of oh you're Imo, i'm yoruba oh you're Aousa, oh no you're kanuri the and those labels shouldn't count or they, don't, should, don't they shouldn't count, count. Shouldn't they shouldn't count because um, when you are born, you are born, like we said earlier when we were speaking at the lobby, you are born a human being first. You are born a person. And then the moment when you went to primary school, uh, secondary school, you were not worried whether the person to your right was, was an Ahmed or the lady sitting in front of you was, was a Choma. No, it wasn't what mattered. It was the fact that you guys were colleagues. Absolutely. And I... And I always like to give this example growing up. Uh, so I, I grew up not my, before my parents, my father began to hammer. We lived in a face man, face you, Roman Palo, Roman Palo um, set of building. And I remember my mom would go to work and she would leave us with my neighbors who yes. were Igbos. Yes. And, I would, and I remember the story very well um, where they, we would go to the house. Normally, when they will have dinner, they would be served in one plate and everybody would everybody eat out of it. The and place. the mom would see me struggle. Because the f meal was literally hot, they were used to swallowing very hot meal, and then she, without being told, she realized there was a struggle. And nobody told Mama Noye to make me a portion of food, serve me separately, and call my siblings and go, no, 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 don't let them eat, and she will serve us separately. Um, till date, the young, the man, because uh, of course Basil is not a man, we're still fantastic. The woman was a year older, two weeks ago. I was there. And I was, I was introduced as her son. Absolutely. I was her son. She didn't say, oh, my neighbor's son. I was her son. Yes. You know, the thing is, I believe that over time, politicians have created this artificial division. That is it. That Us is as it. a people so are naturally united. to understand that they, it is a tool. Yes. Like they've, like they've learned to make hunger. Like they've, like they've learned to make hunger a thing. Yes. A tool. Yes. The same way they, they have come across this d divisive line of tri tribalism yes. and religion to cause a strain amongst the people. Very good. Thank you. Let's talk about uh, the new Naira notes. Yes, today, what do you have for us on that? <laughs> new Naira. Pains persist despite fresh CBN orders. Queues, chaos, and banking halls as scarcity worsens. Days after the Central Bank of Nigeria declared the old 1,000 Naira, 500 Naira, and 200 Naira notes as legal tender, Deposit money banks say they are beginning to run out of the old currencies. This, dis this development led to severe hardship and pains for several bank customers seeking to withdraw funds during the week. Relief may be on the way though. Bank sources stated that over the weekend, the reintroduced old Naira notes will be released by the Apex banks this week, in addition to the new notes in higher volumes to clear the queues in banks. All yours, Dio. Coach K. This uh, new Naira redesign issue coming to the studio this new morning. Naira I debacle. debacle coming to the to the to the studio this morning. I saw queues outside banks. They don't have money to give, old or new. So we're all still suffering. How do you see this? As you've put it, Naira redesign <laughs> debacle, <laughs> not policy debacle. Uh, I, I I think it was I think it was a. Um, policy direction that was executed wrongly okay that wasn't thought through okay um and everything along the line i don't think there was there was um the, both, both the po people who, who thought through the policy i don't think they gave it um, um a, a thorough thought and we can see that clearly um because if you can't give people the new narrative they bring out the old ones CBS says it has it destroyed, said the, it's destroyed old the old ones. ones. The, the new, the old Naira they've been they've been passing out in the last week are the ones that were left in the, left vault, in the vault. vaults. And, and there's a finite amount. It's almost run out. Okay. So that means um, we are not going to go back to explaining to Nigerians that we're going to spend so much money to print Naira notes again. Considering how much it was spent to print. Do you think we should be printing the old notes or the new ones? <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> 
<laughs> Assuming we have to go back and print now. No, we need what, to print. Yeah, what are we going to print? We definitely need to print. What are we going to print? Um, we're on live TV, so I wouldn't be the one to be indicted <laughs> and say that I said they should print either the new Naira or Naira notes. So uh, I would say that whoever is printing the Naira notes, yes, either the new or the old, I think they should be mindful with the cost. Okay. We are running already. We know. We all know. It's it's an open debate that whoever is coming in to take over from the new dispensation, they have their work cut out for them. There are there are the humongous debts that the country has accumulated that need to be paid. So I think there needs to be a mindful way. Um, there, the processes need to be rejigged, I've, and I've and I've consistently always said this all. Well, I say this all the time. Um, every time. <sighs> I'll say, in human, in, human ex in human existence and human interaction, in work, people are employed first for their competences and their know-how. Yes. But they are fired for their behavior. Okay. So what does that tell us? That, that our behavior comes first? Our behavior is paramount in our outcomes? Yeah. You know, I've been talking about the line of people, behavior, and patterns. So, yeah. so are you saying the CBN and the, fe and the federal government misbehaved on the Naira uh, redesign policy? Um, so, Nigeria, you've heard that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but in the, with, with, with regards to the Naira note, mm -hmm. I, um, I think that um, the, the, need, the responsibility, needs, responsibility for that, of course, needs, needs, to be, needs to be added up. In the same climb, we know Ed should roll. But at this point, we can't be crying foul over spilt milk. It's already done. Yes. Um, what can the bank do? I think the CBN needs to expedite faster than normal. I think that the monitoring, monitoring agencies within the CBN now need to be out. Because, of course, there was, it was, there was the lie and the rumor that it was meant to curtail vote buying. Yes. The elections are over. Yes. Uh -huh. So this so let us should open now. So let us hope that the yes. reprieve we, e we expect for yes. Nigerians will come at least, not later before than the end of the week. Yes. The queues at the bank are embarrassing. Mm -hmm. It also now shows that we mm -hmm. also have not built capacity for internet banking like we claim to have. Because if we do... We should not be reacting yes. to the humongous need and demand. Yes, the experience of the average Nigerian has been that most electronic transfers have been hanging, have been oh, I've, had, I've had my fair share, Absolutely. and I'm sure you've had your fair We fashion, all too. have, we all have. So it's not a good situation either with the physical cash or with the online, online electronic cash. aspect yeah. either. So yes, indeed, the central bank and the federal government need to uh, bring soccer to Nigerians quickly now that the elections are over. All right, yet the uh, President Buhari signed something last week to do with constitutional <laughs> amendments. What's that all about? Constitutional amendments. States can now generate, transmit, and distribute their own electricity and set up their own railways and prisons. President Buhari has signed a number of bills amending the constitution to devolve some powers to the states. In addition to moving electricity, railways, and prisons from the exclusive list to the concurrent list, other bills other bills signed into law include financial independence for states' houses of assembly and states' judiciary, as well as a two-month time frame for the submission of the names of ministerial nominees to the National Assembly by the President-elect from the day of his inauguration. Okay, interesting. Uh, this, do I hear restructuring here? And, and if I do hear restructuring, <laughs> why at the 99th hour? I mean, there's been this clamor for devolving power to the states, so now states can generate their own electricity, yeah. build their own railways, and uh, in addition, uh, state houses of assembly and the judiciary be can be independent, states can build their own prisons. So now, the center is pushing away more of its responsibilities onto the states, which is what Nigerians have been clamoring yeah. for. So this is restructuring starting to happen, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's uh, President Buhari saving the best for the last. Mm. Um, I think it was legacy, 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 legacy. legacy. <laughs> <laughs> at this at this point, first it was about making sure that the amended law for the elections um, were were passed. Yes, and that um, it was affected. Yes. And whether or not we are, whether or not people, will, whether or not people like to agree, the reality is that um, we we as a people have come to a place where we've come to realize that it's important. We may not have the process perfect, but we are on the right step towards getting it done. 
Then also, I believe that, um, like you said, we've been clamoring for this state police, um, power generation. And I know states state like Lagos had quite a number of independent power power plants that yes. has already been run. Yes. So I think, so I let like you said, if for the for the governors who are doing the second term and for the governors who are coming in, they have their work cut out for them. And don't forget I started earlier by saying the bulk of this work is about accountability. Yes. So let's see how accountable yes. they will do. It's one thing to get the power. It's another thing to, to be accountable. Yes. And it's not just be accountable to implement it. That's what I'm saying. Yes. It still, it's still forms of accountability because when you're accountable, that means I can hold you responsible for what you said yes. during your campaign. Yes. I can hold you to your manifesto and yes. go, okay, this is what and what and what you said you would do. Yes. Okay, so I've, I give you your first 100 days that, not, that will now turn to a big deal. So what happens after the first 100 days? How do I measure? Mm. Um, what is, because don't forget, it's easy to say the politics is tied strictly to the office holder. But the bulk of the work is the office of the citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, very, citizen engagement. Very true. So how then do we now begin to hold people accountable? Can we boldly get to a place? And I think now, I love what this election has done, which is now about um, it was good seeing governors, uh, House of Rep members going cap in hand, begging the electorate for votes. Yes. So can we take that a notch higher mm. and use the same energy that we challenge them with during the process of the electioneering to hold them accountable to hold them accountable during their tenure and say okay you promised to do this yes so you said this so let's hold you accountable and if you are not doing this can we try and test our laws mm. for a change who says we can't recall people no we can't absolutely. by the time we recall one or two persons mm -hmm. people will do the right thing for their constituents for the electorate people will come home and have more town hall meetings yes people will engage more Absolutely. With the ground. And we will see the impact in the life of our people as we go. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. So, governors, over to you. Now, you have clamored for this power. It's been given to you. So, let's see how your prisons and your railways and your electricity generation. People Maybe make, we will start making having a power joke, now. People are making a joke about the prison part, though. <laughs> 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 Even the rail, the railway part is not clear because Lagos, for example, has been building the blue line and the red line all this time. So it's been building its own railway, but that's for another day. Yet today, what's this about census? How can we do census and election to <laughs> humongous <laughs> undertakings in the same year? How is that oh possible? God. What is happening with the census yet today? Federal government shifts population census to May. Minister of Information and Culture, Alaji Lai Mohammed, has informed Nigerians that the population census earlier scheduled for March 29 has been rescheduled to May 18. The minister stated that the postponement became necessary on the account of the shift of the date of the governorship and state's House of Assembly elections by the Independent National Electoral Commission. He also revealed that the Federal Executive Council approved the sum of 2.8 billion naira for the National Population Commission to procure software to be deployed for the census. A total of 869 billion naira has, is earmarked for the exercise. Population census is a critical ingredient for planning and development. The last one held in Nigeria took place 17 years ago in 2006. Over to you, Dio. Coach K, do you believe we are 217 million people in Nigeria? That's a rough estimate based on the last census 17 years ago. Um, Typically, censuses should be held every 10 years. That's yeah. the global best mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. But we haven't had one for 17 years. So mm -hmm. what they've been doing is estimating, estimating. And of course, the population figures relate to things like budget, planning, development, and things like that. So the numbers being bandied about now are 217 million. Number one, do you believe that number is accurate? Number two, in light of the fact that we've just done a massive election exercise that required logistics, required deployment of ad hoc staff, and all that, is it sensible to, within such a short time, roll out another set of initiatives to count the population at humongous cost? Can it be done effectively and accurately? We're running out of time, so let's kind of try and speed Wow, this. that is going to be a bit tricky to answer. Number one, I, I think the timing is wrong. Mm -hmm. Without thinking, I think the timing is off. But the, the, the need for the censors is important. Reason being this. Okay. Um, the best, the best government in the world. Right. Every best organization is data driven. Yes. Um, nothing can be done that is not data driven. Yes. So we need to have the correct data and all these estimations. Oftentimes, we've seen the reflections of it in how budgets are made, budgets are spent. 
and continuously the government will keep saying oh this is not enough even though we are projecting um Af africa of course we know right now is the one that has the pyramid correct unlike the pyramid that is inverted in europe and what do i mean that means our pyramid are bottom heavy with people in their 30s in their 30s and 20s uh while in europe is the other way around the bottom it is bottom heavy for people in their 60s um so, the, so that means we have a healthier workforce nigeria as a nation in africa is pivotal because it needs to position itself correctly to truly be not just a big brother but to be what it should be the giant of a, of a country so of, I, the I, of the continent thank you very much we need that data to grow as a people we need that data to deploy the right sort of resources we need that data to project also for the next 10 20 years can they get it accurately or will they be counting goats and sheep and <laughs> heads of cattle i don't think that the time is correct i don't think that we are sufficiently ready and prepared to do another um census and mm -hmm. at the back of my mind we've taken this much time so what's the hurry ah uh, yes you're right anything and that should be done should be done correctly and done properly uh, thank you very well said and that's the much we can take on what's your take today we thank you uh for joining us on this edition my name is dayo akintobi you can follow subscribe and like on our social media handles as displayed on our screen thank you for joining us we'll see you again next time good day The Oshun Oshogo Sacred Grove in Oshogo, Oshun State, Southwest Nigeria, is one of the last remnants of primary high forest in southern Nigeria. The site, a natural habitat that has been preserved for over 400 years, has served as both a pilgrim point as well as a tourist center for millions of people who visit the site annually to worship and celebrate the Oshun Goddess that is believed to inhabit the river that runs through the grove giving the water the ability to heal and grant wishes of its believers. Oshun Grove happened to be a site that we all refer to as a living site. We is a living site just because activities that have been carried out over the years are still performed the way it used to be then. And secondly, it is a site where the worshippers do come to perform every fifth of the day, which means five, five days, they do come. For example, in churches, we go to churches during the week, but on Sunday, we question it to be is we go to church on Sunday. Likewise, the Muslim goes to uh, mosque on Friday. So that's why the fact that the devotees do come in Tava, but they have a five, five day, which they call Ojose. Aside this, the uniqueness of this site is the name Oshogo was derived from this site. The appellation of the king was derived from this site. From the entrance, one could feel the tranquility that comes with the well-preserved forest. A little further down comes another feeling of an elevated bean's dwellings. This is the Oshun Oshogo Sacred Grove, one of the last sacred forests in Nigeria along the banks of the Oshun River, just outside the city of Oshogo, Oshun State, Southwest Nigeria. In this forest of 75 hectares of undisturbed areas of land, no residential building is allowed, no killing of any kind of animal, no fishing, no hunting or felling of trees. Apart from the fact that this is 75 hectares of the core zone and 47 hectares of the buffer zone, 
Uh, it's one of its kind in Sub-Saharan Africa and the second UNESCO World Heritage Site in Nigeria. The kind of people or crowd that comes around, one would be marveled why this. But it is a festival and a river that people believe in. Because of the sacredness, it, you can't cut a tree, you can't fish. And if you are not a devotee, there are certain activities you don't do so that you don't blame yourself. The one path that cuts right through the grove is lined on either side with sanctuaries, illustrations of traditional Yoruba deities and primary high forest. Adekunle Olatunji is the curator and site manager of the grove that has existed for over four centuries. On a tour of the sacred forest, Olatunji describes how the name Oshobo came about and what the grove stands for. Some kilometers from here is in Iboku. Uh, there's, there's an altar. It's not just an altar that going to the bush to kill rattle. It's an, a big altar that hunts for elephants, bigger animals. In one of his sojourn, then from Ikole, looking for where they can get water, they now got to this site. On getting to this site, it was uh, astonished. We were looking for almost a 40 kilometer from here, looking for water, see large water here. So he decided to go back to inform the king. That, uh, my brother, I got to, we are hunting, I got to his place and I saw this river. So the, the hunter then was Ogutimei, while the king then at the is Laroye. So the two of them came down to the site, seeing what they wanted. So they decided to settle down at the bank of the river. So in one of their trying to rent the tent, a tree now fell into the river. And a voice came out of the river, saying, Eyoma, Eyoma you have broken my time, but at the four room. So everybody was, the two of them were so shocked. Who is this person? Simultaneously, the spirit now answered. That was when they knew they are in Oshobo. Literally meaning Oshobo. So now, they now felt, what is the next thing to do? In Yoruba then, something strange happened. You do divination. During their divination, they wanted to know what happened. So the Babala owner said, Oshun dwell here. You cannot stay with Oshun. So they move from the bank of the river, move up. They now built a hut. That hut today is what we call the first palace. And there, there's these promises between them. That we said we should leave this place. As a powerful person, they felt, how will somebody in the river be telling us to leave? So if we are to leave, what will you do for us? And I said, okay, if you are to leave, I will make you prosper. There is no war that will conquer you. Do my bidding. And every year, there must be somebody from your lineage to come and bring object of appeasement to me every year. But the grove wasn't always this beautiful and serene. In fact, there was a time it was completely infested with termites until an Austrian artist, Susan Wenga, and her husband, Uli Baya, arrived to save the sacred monument. Wenga devoted some 50 years of her life to preserving the forest, and with the help of local craftsmen in the city, she transformed the sacred grove into a sculptural garden with compelling artworks and objects of habitation. Because of them, this 200 acres is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. When Mama started with the ocean groves, she started at the area we called Ayedaku. Ayedaku is also part of uh, the groves. Our first two sculptures are still there. Here we have uh, Obatala and Yemo. And she did that, you know, uh, not in one place, 
you know, uh, at the main shrine, uh, Ebu Yamako, and inside the forest, there yeah, are the sculptures there that she made. And Mama will do the heart with meditating, you know, like communication with the deity before uh, doing any form of heart. On the news, ex-terrorist negotiator Tokor Mamo arraigned on a 10-count charge for terrorism financing. Goods worth millions destroyed as fire got on each market. And Labour Party's Peter Obi files petition challenging Tinubu's victory demands fresh election. And thanks for joining us on News Now at this hour. I am Sinisala Adigun. The publisher of Desert Herald and former terrorist negotiator Tokor Mamo has been arraigned on a 10 count charge bordering on alleged terrorism financing. Mamo was arraigned on Tuesday by the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation before Federal High Court in Abuja. Mamo is alleged to have received $120,000 as ransom payment on behalf of the Boko Haram terrorist group. The monies were said to have been received from families of hostages kidnapped during the Abuja Kaduna train attack. He was also accused of exchanging voice notes communications relating to the hostages of one Baba Adamu, a Boko Haram spokesperson. The accused has, however, pleaded not guilty to all the counts and denied having allegiance to the terrorists. However, after taking arguments for and against a bail request, Justice Eyang Eko reserved ruling till a date that will be communicated to the parties and order that Mamu remains in the custody of the Department of State Services, CSS, pending the ruling of the bill application. Tragedy has struck in the Onicha area of Anambra State following the outbreak of a fire at the White House section of the main market. The fire started at the early hours of Tuesday in the popular market situated in the Onicha local government area of the state, leading to the loss of several goods worth millions of naira. According to some traders who raised the alarm over the fire, the area mostly affected by the fire is the block of shops under the White House where expensive lace materials are sold. Old. On its main market, famed to be the biggest market in West Africa, hosts a large population of traders who are mainly importers of goods and who also deal in varied products. To electoral matters now, the Labour Party and its presidential candidate Peter Obi have formally filed a petition at the Election Petition Tribunal in Abuja challenging the declaration of Bola Tinubu of the All Progressives Congress, APC, as the winner of the February 25, 2023 presidential election. The petition has the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Tinubu, his running mate, Senator Kashim Shetima, and the APC as the first to fourth president. Respondents. The petitioners specifically allege that at the time of the election, Tinubu was not qualified to contest and argue that the election was invalid by reason of corrupt practices and non compliance with the provision of the Electoral Act of 2022. Obi prayed the tribunal to make an order cancelling the election to conduct a fresh election in which Tinubu, Shatima, and the APC will not participate. 
The Lagos State People's Democratic Party governorship candidate Olajide Adedino, popularly called Jando, has described the outcome of Saturday's governorship election in the state as shocking and not a reflection of the people of the party's worth. Reacting to the outcome of the polls at a news conference, Adedino vowed to pursue the process to the end before letting out his next step of action. Highlighting some flaws in the process, Adedino said that the Saturday's election became like a war, adding that majority of PDP agents and those of other opposition political parties were chased away from coalition centers. I appreciate the people of Lagos uh, for standing firm uh, in the face of oppression and for believing in whatever it is they believe in. We saw everything uh, played out. But in our own case, we want to say that we looked at ourselves and we feel so proud. We feel so proud in the sense that in the face of huge oppression, when we started this project, some people have said, oh, he's deceiving himself. By the time they offer him something now, we will collapse it. Um, we got in between. Somebody, oh, he's a mole in PDP. Somebody sent him to come and do this. Uh, it got to a point they were saying all sorts. Even when some Respected leaders supposedly had to leave us for crumbs within the ruling party. We stay behind to say we are going to see this to the last. Of course, everybody in Lagos um, saw what happened, knew what happened on the street of Lagos. Um, there were voter suppression everywhere, uh, intimidation, harassment, violence. Some people were killed, a lot of people were harmed. And the process of them trying to express or exercise their franchise. For us, we know that the election is already predetermined because before election activities that was happening, we try everything to ensure that we bring this to the notice of the security formations in Lagos. Her condolences to families of those who lost their lives in that election because they, they wanted a better Lagos, because they, they really want to exercise their franchise. And for those who sustain injury everywhere, we, we sympathize with them. Following allegations of non-usage of the bimodal voter accreditation system, Beavers, gross irregularities and intimidation of voters in some parts of Enugu state, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has suspended the collation of results for the governorship election in the state. A breakdown of results collated on Sunday showed that Peter Umba of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, is leading in the race, having won nine out of the 17 local government areas in the state. He is closely followed by the candidate of the Labour Party, Chijioke Edeoga, who has won eight of the local government areas announced. In a statement, INEX National Commissioner and Chairman of the Voter Education Committee, Festus Okoye, said that the decision to suspend the coalition was taken after a review of the election and appealed for the understanding and patience of voters, parties and candidates in the affected states. The Chief Whip of the Senate, Oji Kalu, has said it is his turn to be President of the Senate in the 10th National Assembly. Speaking to journalists at the National Assembly, the lawmaker representing Abia North Senatorial District asked his party, that's the All Progressives Congress, APC, to zone the seat to his district. A correspondent, Mary Kanu, tells us more in this next report. On the 7th of March, 2023, the Independent National Electric Commission, INEC, issued certificates of return to winners of the February 25, 2023 senatorial election. The chairman of INEC, Mahmoud Yakubal, presented the certificates to the senators-elect at the National Coalition Centre in Abuja. Of the 423 legislative seats declared, 109 are Senate seats and ahead of the inauguration of the 10th National Assembly in June, the 
Lagos principal offices, particularly the position of Senate President in the upper chamber, has begun. One of those vying for the position of Senate President and seeking to take over from Senate President Ahmed Lawan is Oji Uzokalu, who has publicly declared his intention to contest for Senate Presidency. President Tinubu needs uh, people of high character to turn around this economy to make sure that we work for the masses and make laws that will enable him to turn around the economy. Nigerian people will pray for me to be Senate President because it is my turn. The former two-term governor of Abia State, who won re-election to represent Abia North in the Red Chamber, has asked his party, the All Progressives Congress, to zone the seat to his district. I'm ready to run for Senate President if the party zone it to my zone, because the party is supreme. Whether they want to zone it, they should zone it to my village, so nobody will contest it against me. I don't even want them to zone it to the south. The party should zone it to Iberi in my ward. So, because I'm the only senator from there, you can manufacture another senator from another local government or from another place in Abia. So, I would like the party to zone it to me with my name. The All Progressives Congress, with a majority in the Senate, has not officially zoned the seat of the leadership positions of the National Assembly for the 10th Assembly, but according to Kalu, with his position as the Chief Whip of the 9th Senate, he is the most ranking senator from the Southeast and therefore deserves the position. Mary Kanu, TV360, Nigeria. The deputy governorship candidate of the Labour Party in Lagos State, Abiodun Oyefusi, has called for the cancellation of the 2023 governorship and State House of Assembly elections, saying that it was not free, fair and credible. Speaking at a press conference held in Lagos, the deputy governor of the Labour Party has vowed to challenge the results of Saturday's election announced by the Independent National Electoral Commission. However, the Labour Party chairman, Dayo Ekong, condemned the violent act of thuggery, attacks and brutal killings during the polls, which resulted in voter apathy and low turnout of voters during the election. A lot of areas, local governments, the election did not take place. The election did not take place because the hoodlums were waiting. In some polling units, we had 50 to 100 hoodlums. And this resulted in voters apathy. People went back home. People refused to come out in fear of their dear lives. How desperate can we be? Nobody deserves to die. I repeat, nobody deserves to die. According to your Electoral Act of 128, 62, 65, decided to throw a blind eye to this, and they went ahead. We of Labour Party, we reject whatever results that was announced and we are now asking and demanding for a total cancellation all these people covered under the electorate act where were they what were they doing are they protecting innocent people this is this is the question we should be asking ourselves how did we degenerate to this level where people no longer have freedom for anything for people's life does not matter. And people's life does not matter. So that, that, that is the big question. And for us, as Labour Party, the election on the 18th of March, there was no election. The Speaker, Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS Parliament, Sidi Tunis, 
has deplored the low representation of Nigerian women in the legislature, saying he plans to engage the country's leadership on this. Tony said this during an interactive session at the two-day symposium on women's proportional representation in politics, organized by the ECOWAS Female Parliamentarians Association, ECOFEPA, in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Tony said the community parliament has a whole year Program in Sierra Leone is just the beginning of many to follow to popularize the idea of 30% affirmative action for women. This is just the beginning. Uh, yes, uh, last year I had a conversation with the ECOWAS Commission and we were able to secure funding just for ECOFEPA. I've been able to encourage them to give me programs and uh, the seminar in Freetown, the Echo Vepa seminar in Freetown, is just the beginning for this year. Immediately after this seminar, we are having a town hall meeting in Abuja, I'm sure end of April, early May. Uh, but it has to happen before the session. This is all, we are doing all of this because we want to popularize the whole idea of the affirmation action, the thirty percent quota for women. Nigeria is key in all of this because in the ECOWAS parliament we are suffering. Uh, out of thirty-five representatives from Nigeria, we only have two women, which is really, really, really not good. I'm hoping to engage. I'm hoping to engage the next speaker in the Nigerian National Assembly and the president of the Senate to encourage them to have more women. We'll take a break here, but still to come, CBN raises interest rate to 80%, retains other parameters. We'll bring you details of the story after this break. Opinions are free, facts are sacred, but truth is universal. How in practical terms can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? The president must see himself as the president of the federal republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa Forest. On DG 360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion facts and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. The new Nigeria is possible, the future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. DG360, dissecting the issues. Welcome back. Let's take a recap of our top stories tonight. The publisher of Desert Herald and a former terrorist negotiator, Toko Mamu, has been arraigned on a 10-count charge bordering on alleged terrorism financing. Mamu was arraigned on Tuesday by the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation before a federal high court in Abuja. Taking arguments for and against the bail request, Justice Ian Echo reserved ruling till the day that will be communicated to the parties an order that Mamu remains in the custody of the Department of State Services, DSS, pending the ruling on the bail application. We also told you that tragedy struck in the Onicha area of Anambra following the outbreak of a fire at the White House section of the May Market. The fire started in the early hours of Tuesday in the popular market situated in the Onicha local government area of the state, leading to the loss of several goods worth millions of naira. 
According to some traders who raised the alarm over the fire, the area mostly affected by the area fire is the block of shops under the White House where expensive lace materials are sold. In case you missed any of our news bulletins or for more updates, you can catch us on Lima Export TV or log on to our website on www.tv360nigeria.com. You can also follow us on our social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram and YouTube at TV360 Nigeria. On Facebook, we're at TV360. U.S. President Joe Biden has signed a bipartisan bill that directs the federal government to declassify as much intelligence as possible about the origins of COVID-19 more than three years after the start of the pandemic. The legislation, which passed both the House and Senate without dissent, directs the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to declassify intelligence related to China's Wuhan Institute of Virology. U.S. intelligence agencies are divided on whether a lab leak or a spillover from animals is the likely source of the deadly virus. Experts say the true origin of the coronavirus pandemic, which has killed more than 1.1 million in the U.S. and millions more around the globe, may not be known for many years. Ahead of the third anniversary of the national lockdown, India is witnessing a steady surge of fresh COVID infections. The health ministry in a statement said in the last days, the number of cases has doubled. It, has, it also added that 918 new COVID-19 cases were registered across India in the last 24 hours, while four people have died due to COVID-related complications. Well, we'll take another break and return with business, international and sports stories. Stay with us. Hello? Yeah, I found your wallet in front of a supermarket. Meet me at Apple Junction. Yes, I'll be waiting for you. Now we find out. <laughs> Two of us. <laughs> Thank you very much, officer. You know, it's surprising that men like you still exist in the police force. Yes, oh, yes. This is just a token <laughs> of my appreciation. Oh, uh, no. You don't need to do this. We are only doing our job. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. God You're bless welcome. you. You're now I know police is really my friend. Yes. Friend. Hey. I, I, oh, with this one? Uh, I don't understand. I mean, wait, wait. You know your problem. You are greedy. Uh, I'm a policeman who is doing his job. All forms of corruption in the force. Not in my country. Corruption not in my country. Welcome back. For Lasha Day, Gourmet Day joins us now with updates in business. Over to you now, for Lasha Day. Well, many thanks, Simi. And in business, the policy setting committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has raised the monetary policy rate, NPR, which measures interest rate from 17.5% to 18%. Governor of the Apex Bank, Godwin Emiafili, announced the development to journalists on Tuesday after the committee's meeting at the CBN headquarters in Abuja. Emifili said the committee members voted to hike the rate by 50 basis points to 18%, adding that although inflation has remained on the increase, the previous tightening measure has continued to reduce the rate of price increase. Committee, however, noted that the narrow redesign and cash withdrawal limit policies have resulted in a sizable reduction in currency outside the bank, 
indicating expected improvement in the potency of monetary policy tools. Members, however, remain aware of the ongoing challenges associated with the limits imposed on cash withdrawals in the face of frequent downtime in bank, in bank electronic transaction channels. Committee thoughts called on the other depository corporations, online payment platforms, and other stakeholders to ensure that the prevailing incidence of network failures is overcome in the immediate and short term. This will ensure that the Naira redesign and lead to an improved inroad of the CBM cashless policy program and efficiency of the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. <laughs> Members thus resolved by a majority vote to raise the monetary policy rate NPR by 50 basis points. In summary, 10 members voted to raise NPR by 50 basis points, one member voted to raise NPR by 25 basis points, and one member voted to hold the NPR. All members voted to keep all other parameters constant. And joining me now to speak on this development is Frank Osubwe, alumnus of the United Nations African Institute for Economic Development and Planning. It's good to have you join me. The Sibian governor has said raising the NPR to 18% was a unanimous decision by committee members and is expected to curtail inf inflation. Now, how do you feel about this decision? Do you think indeed that the hike in, um, if, uh, the hike in interest rates can indeed decelerate interest uh, inflation? Thank you very much. Uh, concerning the decision, well, generally across the world, uh, many or a number of central banks have been increasing interest rates. The aim is to tighten the inflation or control the inflation or keep the rate as low as possible. If um, it's well managed, uh, we've seen the plan, I think it will be positive effect on the Nigerian economy. So the honor lies on the CBN to make sure that the increase and then the expected returns are achieved. After increasing, increasing the interest rates, there is need to also monitor the implementation, monitor the prices of commodities to ensure that we don't have continued increase. Although uh, the inflation rate or the interest rate as such generally was 17.5% and there's a little increase to 18%. However, inflation has um, remained on. There's been increasing prices and as such, we are not too, um, sure what the outcome will be. If, if it's not well implemented, if it's not well managed, the benefits we are likely to lose, and uh, it might lead to worsening economic conditions and continued uh, inflation. Well, it's definitely a wait and see situation, but Frank Osubri, alumnus of the United Nations African Institute for Economic Development and Planning, thank you very much for your time and your contribution. We'll take a breather now and be back with more insights on the stock market. Just stay with us. The bears were dominant on the Nigerian stock exchanges. Market performance ended in the greens at 0.03%. Now we see that market capitalization rates just at a 29.92% trillion basis mark. Now in the aggregate 107 NGX listed equities participated in trading ending with 12 gainers and 12 losers. Linkage assurance led the gainers with 9.76% share price appreciation closing at 45 cover per share followed by WAPIC insurance. Now on the losing side the Kaja Hotel came out last with an end of day price appreciation of 9.65% at 1 Naira 3 cover per share followed by Cadbury Nigeria. Now, at the end of today's trading session on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, we see that a total of 127 million volume of shares valued at 1.586 billion Naira exchange hands in 2,900 
and 87 deals now away from the ngx let's see how some of our select global stock performed uk's FTSE rallied up to 1.72 percent as calm returns to the markets following the takeover of credit series that should be the biggest one day rise since 21st december last year and leaves the index to its highest since last wednesday when fears over the crisis of credit series rocked global markets while U.S. Dow Jones equally had a good trading day, Asian stock Nikkei ended in the reds at 1.42%. I need to wrap on business news and stock market review. Back to you, Simi, for the rest of the news. Thank you very much, Falashali, for that update. And in international stories, police in Kenya have arrested 230 violent protest over the cost of leaving which also saw 31 police officers injured protesters had joined demonstrations in nairobi and other parts of kenya on monday in response to a call by veteran opposition leader raila odinga it was the first major unrest since president william ruto took office in september last year narrowly beating odinga in an election his rival claims was stolen odinga is blaming the government for the economic woes faced by kenyans who are battling high prices for food and fuel a plunging currency and a record drought that has left millions hungry in sports, Kylian Mbappe is set to take over as captain of France after Hugo Lloris stepped down following the World Cup final defeat to Argentina. The 24-year-old has accepted the role after discussions with coach Didier Deschamps. Mbappe's first game as captain will be Friday's Euro 2024 qualifier against the Netherlands at the Stade de France, the first match for Lourdes Blues since the World Cup final in Doha on December 18. Mbappe has scored 19 goals in 24 League One matches this season and contributed seven goals in PSG's run to the last 16 of the Champions League where they were knocked out by Bayern Munich. Well, that's all in our bulletin. Thank you for watching. I'm Simi Solajikun. Bye for now. Opinions are free. Facts are sacred. The truth is universal. How in practical terms can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? The president must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Fabgitha Forest. On Digi 360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion facts and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. A new Nigeria is possible, a future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. DG360, dissecting the issues.
Top of the morning to you, Nigeria, and welcome to What's Your Take? My name is Dayo Akintobi, and I'll be taking you through all the big stories that made the headlines last week. Well, this has been a glorious week um, and a glorious month, a couple of months in Nigeria's history. The elections have come and gone. They are done and dusted. We can relax and breathe again at long last. As you know, the governorship elections held uh, this last Saturday. Uh, the winners, some winners have been declared and some losers are busy um, taking in their loss. As we speak this morning, some are experiencing the thrill of victory and others are suffering the agony of defeat. That's what politics is about. You win some, you lose some. In any political contest, there will be a winner and there will be a loser. However, there have been some firsts in this election that goes to show that our democratic process is deepening and it is progressing. For the first time, uh, we've almost had a female governor. As of this time yesterday, it looked like the APC candidate for Adamawa, a female, was actually going to be our first elected female. However, the news coming out this morning seems to show that uh, the PDP may have taken that state. Nonetheless, whether she gets there or she doesn't get there, she made an extremely good showing, which for the fact that it is even a state in the north that is predominantly a patriarchal society, it is a very good development for our democracy that she had such a good showing. In addition, we also have a reverend for the first time in Benue State, which is a predominantly Muslim state. A Christian reverend has become the governor-elect in Benue State. That is progress. It goes to show that religion is not the primary criteria by which voters now make their voting decisions. And then back in the south, we have what we call the happy hour governor in Akwa Ibom State, which <laughs> has been a joke all through this last week because the PDP candidate in the run-up to the election promised that if he were elected, he would make sure that every Friday uh, drinks would be sold at cut rate price, prices all through Akwa Ibom State. Yet today, my newscaster, are we moving our studio to Akwa Ibom <laughs> State from next month? I think we are we should. recording this show from there so we can get cheap and free drinks? What are you doing? Considering it. I'm, I'm actually considering that. Yeah, actually considering that. Well, mm -hmm. we'll pack up this studio and move right along with you. How have you been and how was your weekend? Did you uh, vote? Uh, how was your voting experience? My weekend has been well. My voting ex experience as well was very smooth and very easy. It took less than five minutes, just as the last presidential elections. Um, I wouldn't say it was the same for other areas because my friends that stay in VGC, they came, woke up as early as 8 a.m., went to the polling units, and they were told three hours after waiting to come back the next day, which was a Sunday, and they spent their whole days there before they were able to vote. So that's yeah. what I have to say about Yes, it. yes. We have reports of isolated and sporadic incidents of uh, violence, of uh, uh, irregularities, mm. of uh, INEC shortcomings. So we can't say the election was perfect. We can't say it was seamless, but at least we've got it done. Winners are starting to be declared, and Nigeria will move on, and we will heal from all of the division, the hate speech, um, mm. the divisiveness, the rancor. We'll pick ourselves up and move on. And hopefully all the new people who will take office May 29 will do their very best to improve the lot of the masses in Nigeria. Now, having said that, um, before we introduce our guest, uh, there's another interesting story we should touch on briefly. And this is how the people in the city of Shagamu, Ogun State, have found themselves having to travel to Ikorodu and in some cases Ijebode to go and uh, queue for cash. Because in their wisdom, they burnt down all the banks in Shagamu in protest <laughs> of the Naira scarcity. So... Who is now paying the price for those burnt banks? They are traveling to Ikorodu. And guess what? When they go to Ikorodu on Friday, the Ikorodu people say, welcome. We're happy you're here, but go to the back. <laughs> you will not collect money before us Ikorodu people go to the back of the queue. So please let us think about the fallout of the things we do before we do them. You burn the bank and it's to your own detriment. So now you don't have anywhere to collect cash in Shagamu. You're not having to go all the way to Ikorodu and then go and take your place in the back of the line behind the indigents who got there before you. All right. So that was just a lighter look at some of the things that happened. Let's get into the more substantive issues. Joining me to take a
Look at the big stories that made the headlines last week is Kolade Stephen Adeni, popularly known as Coach K. Coach K is an experiential learning coach. Wow, that sounds like a very big title. Experiential <laughs> learning coach who is the MD of 361 Degrees Limited, where he functions as a performance improvement and life coach, as well as a business psychologist. Welcome to What's Your Take, Coach K. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Morning. Thank you so much, Mr. Dick. Well, thank you for um, letting me be here. Uh, I think I like your warm, your warm start on the entire news about the Shagamu people burning their banks. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's just very interesting. Um, I know we are yet to get into the art of the conversation, but I think it's a good place to start from, mm -hmm. which is that um, it's easy for you to be, um, to, to be a party of, to the bandwagon effect or find yourself being lost in the concept of the ed, ed, ed mentality. Yes. And you just follow the ed. Um, and at that level, emotions are, are rife. People yes. are not really thinking. Right. They're just going on with the energy that presents, that presents itself. And yes. um, Even if it's a negative energy. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. Like, which is, like I said, uh, one of the things I like to start with, and I think viewers also should, should be mindful of, is the concept of um, what I call the E plus R formula equals O. And um, if we take that into cognizance, then our actions and our responses will be different because it simply states that your emotion plus your response it calls your outcome. Well, fantastic. We will bring you back here to come and teach us all about <laughs> experiential learning. <laughs> Meanwhile, over to you yesterday to give us the very first big story of last week so we can talk about this. Governorship elections. Incumbents keep grip on power in battleground states as INEC begin declaring results. Violence, thuggery, and voter intimidation mar polls in some states. Governors Makinde, Somwolu, Abiodu, Yahaya, Abdul Rasak, Zulum, Buni, others win second term. Over to you, Dayo. All right. Okay, Coach K. Well, um, I don't know what your take is on the entire general elections from the presidential three weeks ago to the governorship yesterday. But as I said in my opening monologue, bottom line is the elections are done and dusted. Done and dusted. We have a new crop of leaders, mm -hmm. although the results are still being announced yeah. from the governorship one. But we have a new crop of leaders. What would you like to see? from the new people who take power in May 29th compared to those who are going out now? What, what, do you, what are your expectations of our new crop of leaders? Um, without thinking, I think this one is a no-brainer. So I think the missing nexus between leadership and the people is accountability. I think that's one thing that was deeply missing for the outgoing executives, either at the state level as governors or uh, vis-a-vis -vis even the president. Um, I think there was a lot of lack of accountability. Um, and I think if you look at human nature in itself with regards to people, you find out that the lack of people being accountable for what you promise to do, uh, what you deliver, and the fact that even when you do things out of what you promise, you see the need for you to tell people that um, these are the reasons for this action, and this is how it will impact. Um, case in point, case in point, the Lagos gubernatorial race, which became interesting, between the incumbent and, of course, the um, the out of the blue candidate who mm -hmm. gave us another three leg three leg horse race in Lagos. Yes, Labour Party. Uh, Labour Party contestant. Can, contestant, and then you would suddenly realize that it became an issue more because the same governor that didn't show that could not and i'm picking my words carefully that could not show up for the debates for the um gubernatorial debate across across the state suddenly found out that in, in two weeks he needed to be accountable all of a sudden and then which also now brings to fore the conversation that if you've done your job so well then you don't need to explain to people that uh, your job was well done they will see they will they know should see they should know it they should, should be automatic. See. So which, of course, now also now brings to bear the fact that the people who are the minders, the media minders of the governor, apparently should be, um, should step up their game. And then they should be held responsible. Because if the governor has done so much, how come that the narrative is not directly impacted 
on the people. Um, we, of course, I grew up, of course, you've been very familiar that we grew up with the Mamsa, with, with, the, with the Mamsa logo where we knew that it was mass mobilization. People were heavily sensitized. So, and I think also that is another thing we're still talking about accountability, accountability that the current government or the incoming government must make very, very, must make um, an imperative. Otherwise, we find ourselves going back to the conversation of, oh, you're Imo, I'm Yoruba, oh, you're Aousa, oh, no, you're Kanuri. The and those labels shouldn't count. Or they, don't, should, don't they shouldn't count. count. Shouldn't they shouldn't count because um, when you are born, you are born, like we said earlier when we were speaking at the lobby, you are born a human being first. You are born a person. And then the moment when you went to primary school, uh, secondary school, you were not worried whether the person to your right was, was an Ahmed or the lady sitting in front of you was was a choma. No, it wasn't what mattered. It was the fact that you guys were colleagues. Absolutely. And I, and I always like to give this example growing up. Uh, so I, I grew up not my, before my parents, my father began to hammer. We lived in a face me face you room and palo room and palo um set of building and i remember my mom would go to work and she would leave us with my neighbors who yes. were Igbos. Yes. and i would and i remember the story very well um where they, no, we, we would go to the house normally when they will have dinner they would be served in one plate and everybody would everybody eat out of it the and place. the mom would see me struggle because the f meal was literally hot they were used to swallowing very hot meal and then she without being told she realized there was a struggle and nobody told Mama Noye to make me a portion of food, serve me separately and call my siblings and go, no, no, no don't let them eat. And she will serve us separately. Um, till date, the young the man, because of course Basim is not a man, we're still fantastic. The woman was a year older two weeks ago. I was there and I was, I was introduced as her son. Absolutely. I was her son. She didn't say, oh, my neighbor's son. I was her son. Yes, you know, the thing is, I believe that over time, politicians have created this artificial division. That is it. That Us is as it. a people so are naturally why we need united. To understand that they, it is a tool. Yes. Like they've like they've learned to make hunger. Like they've like they've learned to make hunger a thing. Yes. A tool. Yes. The same way they they have come across this the divisive line of tri tribalism yes. and religion to cause a strain amongst the people. Very good. Thank you. Let's talk about uh, the new Naira notes. Yeah, Tunde, what do you have for us on that? <laughs> new Naira. Pains persist despite fresh CBN orders. Queues, chaos, and banking halls as scarcity worsens. Days after the Central Bank of Nigeria declared the old 1,000 Naira, 500 Naira, and 200 Naira notes as legal tender, deposit money banks say they are beginning to run out of the old currencies. This, dis this development led to severe hardship and pains for several bank customers seeking to withdraw funds during the week. Relief may be on the way though. Bank sources stated that over the weekend, the reintroduced old Naira notes will be released by the Apex banks this week, in addition to the new notes in higher volumes to clear the queues in banks. All yours, Dio. Coach K. This uh, new Naira redesign issue coming to the studio this new morning. Naira I debacle. debacle coming to the to the to the studio this morning. I saw queues outside banks. They don't have money to give, old or new. So we're all still suffering. How do you see this? As you've put it, Naira redesign <laughs> debacle, <laughs> not policy <laughs> debacle. Uh, I, I I think it was I think it was a. Um, policy direction that was executed wrongly okay that wasn't thought through okay um and everything along the line i don't think there was there was um the, both, both the po people who, who thought through the policy i don't think they gave it um, um a, a thorough thought and we can see that clearly um because if you can't give people the new narrative they bring out the old ones CBN says it has it destroyed, said the, it's destroyed old the old ones. ones. The, the new, the old Naira they've been they've been passing out in the last week are the ones that were left in the, left vault, in the vaults. Vaults and and there's a finite amount. It's almost run out. Okay, so that means um, we are now going to go back to explaining to Nigerians that we are going to spend so much money to print Naira notes again, considering how much it was spent to print. Do you think we should be printing the old notes or the new ones? <laughs> <laughs> Assuming we have to go back and print now. No, we need what, to print. Yeah, what are we going to print? We definitely need to print. What are we going to print? Um, we're on live TV, so I wouldn't be the one to be indicted <laughs> and say that I said they should print either the new Naira or Naira notes. So uh, I would say that whoever is printing the Naira notes, yes. either the new 
or the old. I think they should be mindful with the cost. We are running already. We know. We all know. It's it's an open debate that whoever is coming in to take over from the new dispensation, they have their work cut out for them. There are there are the humongous debts that the country has accumulated that need to be paid. So I think there needs to be a mindful way. Um, there, the processes need to be rejigged. I've, and I've and I've consistently always said this all. Well, I say this all the time. Um, every time. Pff, <laughs> I'll say it. In human, in, human ex in human existence and human interaction in work, people are employed first for their competences and their know-how. Yes. But they are fired for their behavior. Okay. So what does that tell us? That, that our behavior comes first? Our behavior is paramount in our outcomes? Yeah. You know, I've been talking about the line of people, behavior, and patterns. So, yeah. so are you saying the CBN and the, and the federal government misbehaved on the Naira uh, redesign policy? Um, so, Nigeria, you've heard that. <laughs> but, <said. laughs> <laughs> but, 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 in the, we, we, with regards to the Naira note, mm -hmm. I, um, I think that um, the, the, need, the responsibility, needs, responsibility for that, of course, needs needs to be needs to be added up in the same climb. We know heads should roll, but at this point, we can't be crying foul over spilled milk. It's already done. Yes. Um, what can the bank do? I think the CBN needs to expedite faster than normal. I think that the monitoring, monitoring agencies within the CBN now need to be out because, of course, there was it was there was the lie and the rumor that it was meant to curtail vote buying. Yes, the elections are over. Yes, uh -huh. so this so let us should open now. So let us hope that the yes. reprieve we e we expect for yes. Nigerians will come at least not later before than the end of the week. Yes, the queues at the bank are embarrassing. Mm -hmm. It also now shows that we also have not built capacity for internet banking, like we claim to have. Because if we do. We should not be reacting yes. to the humongous need and demand. Yes, the experience of the average Nigerian has been that most electronic transfers have been hanging, have been failing. Oh, I've had, I've had my fair share, Absolutely. and I'm sure you've had your fair we share We all too. have, we all have. So it's not a good situation, either with the physical cash or with the online, online electronic cash. aspect yeah. either. So yes, indeed, the central bank and the federal government need to uh, bring soccer to Nigerians quickly now that the elections are over. All right, yet the, uh, President Buhari signed something last week to do with constitutional <laughs> amendments. What's that all about? Constitutional amendments. States can now generate, transmit, and distribute their own electricity and set up their own railways and prisons. President Buhari has signed a number of bills amending the constitution to devolve some powers to the states. In addition to moving electricity, railways, and prisons from the exclusive list to the concurrent list, other bills other bills signed into law include financial independence for state houses of assembly and state judiciary, as well as a two-month time frame for the submission of the names of ministerial nominees to the National Assembly by the President-elect from the day of his inauguration. Okay, interesting. Uh, this, do I hear restructuring here? And, and if I do hear restructuring, <laughs> why at the 99th hour? I mean, there's been this clamor for devolving power to the states, so now states can generate their own electricity, yeah. build their own railways, and uh, in addition, uh, state houses of assembly and the judiciary Have can be independent, funding. states can build their own prisons. So now, the center is pushing away more of its responsibilities onto the states, which is what Nigerians have been clamoring yeah. for. So this is restructuring starting to happen, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's uh, President Buhari saving the best for the last. Um, I think it was legacy, 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 legacy. legacy. <laughs> <laughs> at, this, at this point, first it was about making sure that the amended law for the elections um, were, were passed. Yes. And that um, it was affected. Yes. And whether or not we are, whether or not people, will, whether or not people like to agree, the reality is that um, we, we as a people have come to a place where we've come to realize that it's important. We may not have the process perfect, but we are on the right step towards getting it done. Then also, I believe that, um, like you said, we've been clamoring for this state police, um, power generation. And I know states, state like Lagos had quite a number of independent power, power plants that yes. has already been run. Yes. So I think, so I let, like you said, if for the 
for the governors who are doing the second term and for the governors who are coming in, they have their work cut out for them. And don't forget I started earlier by saying the bulk of this work is about accountability. Yes. So let's see how accountable yes. they will do. It's one thing to get the power. It's another thing to, to be accountable. Yes. And not just be accountable to implement it. That's properly. what I'm saying. It's yes. still it still forms of accountability because when you're accountable, that means I can hold you responsible for what you said yes. during your campaign. Yes. I can hold you to your manifesto and yes. go, okay, this is what and what and what you said you would do. Yes. Okay, so I've, I give you your first hundred days that not, but that will not turn to a big deal. So what happens after the first hundred days? How do I measure? Mm. Um, what is because don't forget it's easy to say the politics is tied strictly to the office holder. But the bulk of the work is the office of the citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, very, citizen engagement. Very true. So how then do we now begin to hold people accountable? Can we boldly get to a place? And I think now, I love what this election has done, which is now about, um, it was good seeing governors, uh, House of Rep members going cap in hand, begging the electorate for votes. Yes. So can we take that a notch higher hmm. and use the same energy that we challenge them with during the process of the electioneering to hold them accountable to hold them accountable during their tenure and say okay you promised to do this yes so you said this so let's hold you accountable and if you are not doing this can we try and test our laws mm. for a change who says we can't recall people no we can't absolutely. by the time we recall one or two persons mm -hmm. people will do the right thing for their constituents for the electorate people will come home and have more town hall meetings yes people will engage more Absolutely. With the ground. And we will see the impact in the life of our people as we go. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. So, governors, over to you. Now, you have clamored for this power. It's been given to you. So, let's see how your prisons and your railways and your electricity generation. People Maybe make, we will start making having a joke power now. People were making a joke about the prison part, though. <laughs> <laughs> Even the, rail, the railway part is not clear because Lagos, for example, has been building the blue line and the red line all this time. So it's been building its own railway, but that's for another day. Yet today, what's this about census? How can we do census and election? Two humongous <laughs> undertakings <laughs> in the same year. How is that oh possible? God. What is happening with the census yet today? Federal government shifts population census to May. Minister of Information and Culture, Alaji Lai Mohammed, has informed Nigerians that the population census earlier scheduled for March 29 has been rescheduled to May 18. The minister stated that the postponement became necessary on the account of the shift of the date of the governorship and state house of assembly elections by the independent national electoral commission. He also revealed that the federal executive council approved the sum of 2.8 billion naira for the national population commission to procure software to be deployed for the census. A total of 869 billion naira has, is earmarked for the exercise. Population census is a critical ingredient for planning and development. The last one held in Nigeria took place 17 years ago in 2006. Over to you, Dio. Coach K, do you believe we are 217 million people in Nigeria? That's a rough estimate based on the last census 17 years ago. Um, Typically, censuses should be held every 10 years. That's yeah. the global best mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. But we haven't had one for 17 years. So mm -hmm. what they've been doing is estimating, estimating. And of course, the population figures relate to things like budget, planning, development, and things like that. So the numbers being bandied about now are 217 million. Number one, do you believe that number is accurate? Number two, in light of the fact that we've just done a massive election exercise that required logistics, required deployment of ad hoc staff, and all that, is it sensible to, within such a short time, roll out another set of initiatives to count the population at humongous cost? Can it be done effectively and accurately? We're running out of time, so let's kind of try and speed Wow, this. that is going to be a bit tricky to answer. Number one, I, I think the timing is wrong, mm -hmm. without thinking. I think the timing is off, but the, the, the need for the censors is important. Reason being this. Okay. Um, the best, the best government in the world. Right. Every best organization is data driven. Yes. Um, nothing can be done that is not data driven. Yes. So we need to have the correct data and all these estimations. Oftentimes, we've seen the reflections of it in how budgets are made, budgets are spent, and continuously the government will keep saying, "Oh, this is not enough," even though we are projecting. Um, Af Africa, of course, we know right now is the one that has the pyramid correct, unlike the pyramid that is inverted in Europe. And what do I mean? That means our pyramid are bottom-heavy 
with people in their 30s, in their 30s and 20s, uh, while in Europe is the other way around. The bottom, it is bottom heavy for people in their 60s. Um, so, the, so that means we have a healthier workforce. Nigeria as a nation in Africa is pivotal because it needs to position itself correctly to truly be not just a big brother, but to be what it should be, the giant of a, of a country. So of, I, the I, of the continent. Thank you very much. We need that data to grow as a people. We need that data to deploy the right sort of resources. We need that data to project also for the next 10, 20 years. Can they get it accurately or will they be counting goats and sheep and heads <laughs> of cattle? I don't think that the time is correct. I don't think that we are sufficiently ready and prepared to do another um, census. And at the back of my mind, we've taken this much time. So what's the hurry? Ah, yes, you're right. Anything and that should be done should be done correctly and done properly. Uh, thank you. Very well said. And that's the much we can take on what's your take today. We thank you uh, for joining us on this edition. My name is Dayo Akintobi. You can follow, subscribe, and like on our social media handles as displayed on our screen. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time. Good day. My name is Collins Abinoro Aporode, and um, I'm an artist. Um, uh, I create um, sculptures, um, lots of uh, mixed media um, art as well, and lots of drawing. But mainly, I'm uh, well known with my stainless uh, cutlery sculptures. Well, professionally, I graduated 2012, and uh, I immediately I graduated. I started out uh, into full-time studio practice because I've actually made up my mind from an early age what I wanted, and um, it wasn't difficult finding my feet or making the decision on where to begin, on how to start, or what I wanted. I immediately I left school. So as soon as I left school 2012, I started out professionally. Stainless spoon sculptures I actually started, my first piece was made in 2011 as a student in one of my exploratory uh, courses and uh, metal constructions. I stumbled into the material and um, I never stopped creating since that time.
as, as a child, I'm fascinated by um, life, the, the beauty of, of life, the beauty of creations, um, birds. I grew up in a rural environment, so I was largely inspired by the rural life. You know, we used to do a lot of um, bird hunting as, as a child. I guess um, that started out my passion and interest in uh, creating a lot of uh, bird sculptures earlier on. I still do a lot of them till now anyway. To have evolved into more uh, engaging pieces in terms of conceptualization and material usage and all that. But, so I guess my, my, in, my, my interest in the things that happens around me, my environments, you know, natural phenomena, you know, politics and all of that, part of the things that made up my interest in art. And of course, family life were part of uh, the things that inspires everything I do. As a person, one of the things that actually strikes me growing up, where uh, I, I used to always ask myself the question, why do we think the way we do? Why do humans behave the way they behave? Why do the certain kind of people act in a certain way? Why are people having interest in certain things? You know, so the, 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 these puzzling questions are things that have resonated in my mind growing up as a child. And they are things I still want to, I still constantly explore with my work. You know, trying to understand human nature, trying to understand the spirituality behind our behavior, behind our temperaments, behind who we are, what we aspire, what we think, what, why we act in a certain way. So there are a whole lot of things. That's why I could actually sum it up that say life is everything that inspires what I create and what I do. Growing up, the, the only art I think I, I saw earlier on were uh, pieces of um, beaded uh, clothing that were made by my mother. I, mean, I think I, I, was, I grew up seeing about two of such clothes that she made as a young lady at that time. But apart from that, there were no other artistic um, background. But usually, uh, when I had a consciousness and realization that my mom did crafts like that, you know, as a young lady, I, th I think my energy was born out of her. I, 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 I guess somewhere I had, I had contacted the, uh, the gifts from her. But apart from that, there were actually no uh, artistic um, backgrounds growing up as a young person. Mm -hmm. 